You're listening to Earnestly Speaking, the only weekly podcast that covers friends, foes, and anything that goes. And now, for your badass host, Ernest Owens. And we're back for another episode of Earnestly Speaking with your host, Ernest Owens, myself. (laughs) Oh, this has been such a very... um, jolly season of sorts. Um, I've really enjoyed just all of the Thanksgiving energy. It has been quite the time spent. Um, I really did have a really great Thanksgiving uh, weekend. I feel really rested and rejuvenated. I slept a lot. Um, I went out a little bit, but not too, too much. Not, Not so much that I felt inconvenienced. If that makes sense. You know, I wasn't doing a lot of ripping and running through the community. Like, I just was like, I'm keeping my ass in the house. And it was great because my house had a really good deep clean um, that was long overdue. I try to do a serious deep clean. um, I want to say every season, like every like a winter, summer, spring and fall. So this was long overdue. But I think initially I was like, oh, I'm going to have a party you know, in my place. And I was like, we end up doing, you know, another place in the place. But for Thanksgiving, I hosted um, friends over. It was like a wonderful friends, family, you know, giving situation. I had, um, you know, my brother from Temple who came, you know, because we just decided like these kids, Thanksgiving breaks ain't like they used to be. Like they they got a couple of little days. It's like, you want to spend that money and fly you out? To, to Houston for a couple of days. And then by the time you get all excited, you got to come right back. It's no point. So I think the new trend is, is that, well, it's always been the case for me is it's like Thanksgiving with on the East coast always. Um, my mother-in-law, she's Muslim. So she doesn't celebrate. Um, I mean, she doesn't really celebrate any holidays, but Christmas is something that she clearly doesn't celebrate. So the way that we've always had it is that, we do Thanksgiving on the East Coast because Mr. Johnson's family lives in Trenton. And then we do the holidays, Christmas and all that in the South because I stayed there for an exponential amount of time. And so this time around, I'm going to be in Houston for, for, for a nice period of time. So anybody that's in Houston that want to link up in December, I am your guy. I'm going to be there from December... December 14th, no, December 16th to December 30th. We're going to do like Saturday to Saturday. It's going to be like the 14th to the 30th, Uh, the 16th, I'm sorry, the 16th, 14 days, 16th to the 30th. It'll be two straight weeks. It's going to be Saturday to Saturday. Like it's going to be a two week situation. And this is the longest I've spent, um, you know, in, 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 in Texas this long. Normally, I'm normally like a a one week and maybe two days guy. Like a I used to be like a nine to ten days. But when I looked at those plane, those those flights and those plane tickets and all of the madness in between, it just made sense to just go ahead and do two weeks. Cause I was trying to play around with certain days and I was just like, none of these are hitting. Or the the travel times were like weird, or I couldn't get nonstop. And I am a nonstop you know, connoisseur. I'm a pre-check advocate. I'm a nonstop connoisseur. I, I don't like straight through. I will pay the extra for peace of mind. Because the thing is that I, I tell a lot of people and see here I am going into a rabbit hole of what I did not think I was going to be talking about. But I think it's on you all's mind, right? Traveling for the holidays. I suppose it's relevant. But one of the things I'm big on is I don't like, like when I hear stories, horror stories of people having delays in flights. I always notice a pattern and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I could be wrong, but the pattern I've noticed has been that most of those delays and problems happen with the connector flights. A lot of them do. Now you might have a delay in the beginning, maybe, maybe, but it's those connector flights that causes the problem. So what I mean by that is when you don't do a nonstop, like, so you say, okay, this flight is $300, you know, round trip, right? Or, you know, maybe, you know, okay, 
You're like, look, when you look at that, you say, okay, well, I'm going to have a little stop over here in Phoenix. And then before that stop, I'm going to have a stop here in Dallas before I wait an hour to, you know, so you're doing all of that. Right. And that in this, in this economy, like in this air flight world, that's where the problems start because, okay, your first trip, right. When you made, before you connected to the next trip, smooth, clean, everything you wanted to be right. And then what was supposed to be a one hour gap between you going to, you know, X, Y, and Z gets extended because the other connector flight, whatever you was dealing with has not shown up yet. So now you're waiting longer to get on that flight and it's being delayed. That's where the problems typically hit. So my mindset is my strategy has always been get a early, a early, a super early flight one way. I'm not one way, uh, a nonstop, nonstop. Get a super early flight nonstop to get to where you need to go and get a super early non nonstop flight when you are you know, trying to get back. Now, here's the thing. If you have a short traveling distance, so for example, later this week, I'm going to Detroit. My cousin Rachel is getting married. So the whole family is going there. Um, we're going to go to Detroit. It's going to be fun. She's getting married. I'm super excited. Um, uh, Rachel's getting married. Um, we're, that flight is like from Philly to Detroit is about an hour and some change, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. I don't know if it's an hour. It's like about an hour and 15 minutes, roughly. It's very, very short. Something like that. You could, you could, you could play a little bit with, if you're doing a nonstop, you're not playing any games. You can, you can, you can give yourself a little bit of grace with time with that. Right. But you don't want to play with connector flights where, Okay, you got one part you committed to, then the other part is wow. The only time that I cannot get a rid of a connector flight, I believe it was Mar it's Martha's Vineyard. I think getting to Martha's Vineyard, I have to stop in DC or stop somewhere, if I'm not mistaken. Or maybe it's with the airlines I'm with. But like, I don't mind that because it's not too much of a gap because there's other, you know. You can, you could, I think there's some one ways. I think that one time it was just nearly impossible to do it with the schedule I had. So like Martha's Vineyard, you know, I personally am a plane. I, I, I don't drive to, to the vineyard um, I, personally. I think, you know, but it was almost hard to get a one way, I think. Now those rich folks got their little private jets, so they just do whatever. But, you know, I think I had to do one stop in DC and then from DC, take it to the next level. I think that's what it was. But I think there was like a connector involved. But it wasn't that bad because everything was like kind of in the same coast, in the same time zone. But, I mean, sometimes it is impossible to get a nonstop. Very seldom, though. A lot of y'all look shoot for the nonstop. If that means you have to get up a little bit earlier or not. But I just feel like when I hear horror stories of delays, and I've been fortunate to not have any delays in my traveling that's me knocking on wood because i want to keep it that way just like you know everything else when i did my book tour everything was non-stop everything was non-stop on the book tour i didn't do any i couldn't play because i was doing some mission impossibles you know where <laughs> i was right or if, if, if things would have got weird or would have got off at one bit that could have ate up you know time to get changing things so i couldn't play but I will say that nonstop is the way to go, people. If you can get a nonstop flight, please get a nonstop flight. This is me talking to my millennials. Some of you, my, my Gen Xs, y'all been there, done that. Y'all looking like, of course. But it's not, of course, to my millennials. Like, my millennials, we're getting older, okay? The Gen, the Gen Zers, my brother, his, people his age, they, they, they starting to get a little bit fun with the flights. But my millennials, it's time for us to grow up. It's time for us to start... Doing things a little, a little we, 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 at, we, we there now, y'all. We, the majority of us are in our thirties now. We, 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 yeah, pretty much. I think my husband is like the, is on the cusp. He's like the last year millennials. He's a millennial, but he's like the final year. Thank goodness. But like, <laughs> he, he, it's like, we're, most of us are in our thirties now. The majority of millennials are in our thirties. So, I'm asking for my fellow millennials to just, we, listen, they want to blame us for killing all types of industries. I don't believe that. But one thing I want to say, it's time for us to let go. It's time for us to be, 
full adults. And what I mean by that is we, we, we get a, we're taking our flighting situation seriously. We're not just bringing a carry on. We, we, we're going to invest in luggage because if we're going somewhere for days on end, stuffing all your clothes in, in a carry on is not the way. OK, just just saying we're making reservations. Yep, we're making reservations to restaurants. We're just now rolling up with six people thinking that people are going to just seat us. We make it reservations in advance. We do a prefix menus with, with parties larger than, you know, five or four. We, we do a prefix menus for large parties. We understand our limits when it comes to drinking. We're just not blacking out anymore. We could do shots. We still got a little bit of shots in us, but very seldom. But we're just not blacking out no more. We, we know how to control our liquor intake when we go out. We, we know, we know, we know three is the magic number for some and some is two. And some is a sip. <laughs> Everybody got a different range. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we're learning. We're learning. You know, we're learning. We're, we're practicing our boundaries. You know, we're, we're giving gifts. For birthday parties, you know, we we not we not coming to stuff empty handed when there's no other fees associated with food. You know, we, we're being grown, we're being adults, we're being thoughtful. You know, so that's 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 my thing. That's you know, I you know I'm 32 now, and I don't know. I feel why do I? <laughs> but for why why are we acting like we in our 40s? I feel like. 30s is the 40s for us millennials because it feels like we've we've had to grow up a little bit faster compared to our parents. Like they didn't have to deal with the the, the pandemic. I mean, in their in our age group, could you imagine being in your 20s and and, and getting and, and turning 30 and, and having to go through a pandemic economically and socially like that? That ain't easy. Okay, they didn't have anything like that in their generation. Now the early boomers, I, I ain't gonna play with them. Okay, because when polio was running rampant and FDR had like a, a a complete reign as president of the United States, and you had the Great Depression, that's some real shit. But this nothing we haven't had any. What what has happened in the past couple of years since the pandemic? I mean, during the pandemic, all that the war hasn't seen. So I do give us a little bit of grace. But that being said, we we definitely know a little bit more that we've survived that era. We've been able to continue to pick ourselves up. And so I just don't want people to give millennials a little bit more grace because we kept the economy going. Okay. We we stayed on it. We didn't give up hope. We kept creating art and supporting art. And um, yeah, I, I, you know, every other generation ain't, you know, they did their part. But millennials, we we're the target base of voters now. And we're the target base for a lot of things to keep the economy afloat. So we we maintained, and that was not easy. It was a lot going on in the world. Still is. And so I just think about all of those things. But anyway, what does it have to do with Thanksgiving? I mean, it does a lot to do with Thanksgiving. I'm grateful to be alive. And I'm thankful to have good friends and folks that just, you know, pour into me. But also, you know, allow me to do me. Um, you know, Thanksgiving time, I recognize there's a lot of people who who have unresolved tension or issues with family. And, you know, everybody can't go home to a family or create a family in the city they live in because they got so many things. So it's it's a lot. A lot of times you get reminded, like, damn, there are people out here who really, you know, don't have a place to go for Thanksgiving or don't have folks they can celebrate with for various reasons. And you're reminded of, of of that. And so gratitude has been big on me lately. Just being grateful. There's there's so many, you know, it's an evil world we live in, the great future said once. It's a, it's a evil world we live in, he said. Um in, in future verse seven. Um as a member of the future have it, it's an iconic, you know, quote. You know, sometimes, you know, you got situations where you created a friends given right in your own backyard, but the people that you might have thought would be there We'll go to go to Baltimore with the straights. It's the evil world we live in. You know, you just never know. You know, you you be thinking people are are busy and focused and they studying and, and things, and you find out they got all the time in the world to be with the straights. I'm not speaking from personal experience. I'm just thinking out loud. But you know, it's it's you know, it's a time to show gratitude and be grateful for 
the people that make plans and the people that make time and, and the people that, you know, you know, make that make that time and and, and share it with you. It's important. Speaking of sharing time, um, Amanda, uh, Dr. Parks and I, we went to Sakala at the Divine Lorraine. <laughs> We went to Sakala, and I'm going all over because I want to go back to Thanksgiving, but I just felt this thread in me. Um, we went to Sakala at the Divine Lorraine um, uh, the day, the night before Thanksgiving. Um, where was she doing Thanksgiving? You know, I don't, I, I don't know. You know, she was, she was in, she was in Baltimore. I think she was, coincidentally. Um, but we had an Italian feast, and it was so much food. And I have not, so I have this thing I'm doing. I've, I've been doing it for a couple of weeks now, and I haven't said it out loud, but I've been doing this series of called Spin the Block. And basically I'm going, okay, so I'm going to new restaurants on a regular basis, as you already know. But I'm also going back to restaurants who's been around for a minute that for whatever reason, we don't hear enough about them, but they're still killing it. They're still doing a good job. And Sakala at the Divine Lorraine is this Italian restaurant that when it first came out, everybody was going, you know, was 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 this you know, standing out. They were big, huge stands at the place. And it's still good. And it's it's cool. And we went and we just had this really intimate dinner. We was there for like three hours. They, I mean, we had a feast. I mean, just the pastas, the 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 the, the seafood, the, the 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 lamb. We had a rack of lamb that was impeccable. And the pasta just was was wild. And the oh my god, the antipasti, like all of the different olives and stuffed olives and, and, and cheeses. And, oh, it was so good. It was, a, it was a feast. Dessert was divine. The gelato was incredible. Um, that was just so Italian, so Italian, very, very Italian. I mean, they had the candles going. They showed us the, the we had a Dorad fish. They showed us the fish, the, the full fish. And then they let us look at it. So I got to take a picture. And then they went back in the kitchen and then did they think? And I think it was like Southern Italian, I believe he was in Sicilian, which I believe is um is is I think it's I don't I it could be Northern Italian. Um I believe it is Northern Italian. I could be wrong, but it was incredible. I mean, yeah, it is Northern Italian. It is definitely Northern Italian. Um the food is incredible. It was a, it's, it, no, it's not. It's Southern Italian because, yes, so it's Sicilian and Sicilian is south of, of, of um, Italy. Um, it's Southern Italian cuisine, not Northern. And there is a difference. I feel like Sicilians use more red sauce. I feel like Southern Italian is more red, in my opinion. I feel like there's more red sauce over there in Sicily. And I feel like Northern Italian, they like to go with like white, more white sauce, more, you know, white wine, I feel like it, it gets a little bit more seafood over there. I feel like that's the difference in my culinary mind. I could be, I could be wrong. I'm not Italian, but I just remember like when I eat Southern Italian, it's more red. It's more, it's more, you know, but Northern Italian is good too. Cause who had good Northern Italian, Italian, Res Ipsa, Res Ipsa had good Northern Italian. Now Southern Italian, again, Sicilian is at Irwin's. Irwin's over there at the Bach Bar, they got some incredible Italian over there too. Like everybody has, I mean, Philly is such an Italian city, but the the, the Sakala at North Broad, okay, over there at the Divine Lorraine Hotel, the historic hotel, that food was awesome. It was a very good time. Lots of wine. I drank more wine than cocktails because that's how good the wine was there as well. It's a good red, a rich red. Oh, so good. But Thanksgiving was great as well. It was phenomenal. Thanksgiving was catered by details by Miss Dawn, my personal caterer. She caters everything. My birthday, my wedding shower, Thanksgiving. Sometimes she does New Year's when she's available. But she, you know, she's just my go-to for any major catering that I need. Um, any big major catering, family gathering. She's just, her food is is just, it speaks to me. And it's hard to find a really good, you know, black-owned soul food type of, you know, setup. You know, a lot of people in Philly, their, their, their balance of seasoning is just off. No shade. But, like, there's people that cater... And it's too much. Like I don't want flowers in my food. Like it's this this mm, this city's too small. I'm not gonna get too descriptive. But there's some caterers 
that hypothetically speaking that will love to put those edible flowers or eatable flowers in your food and you open it up you're like why do you have all of that decor that's just too much i feel like it cheapened the food like a couple of rosemary swigs or some thyme is fine but when you're doing all the flowers and all that for catering it's too much just yeah and then also like seasoning right some people just do too much like it's like oh my goodness so much nutmeg on sweet potatoes or yams over overkill or you know just it's a lot of caterers people that okay you could cook for your family and you might do a good job but you don't know how to run a massive large-scale catering company like your cooking was good for a small batch but it wasn't meant to be expanded that's what i feel with some of the catering i've been seeing lately people trying to you know everybody can cook should not go into catering I hope that makes sense. Like, you could be a good cook for like four or five people in your family, but to try to translate whatever you're doing at home for them into catering, everyone doesn't have that talent. It's an art to that. It's it's an art. And you also have had to bend, do, you have to do it for a while. I see a lot of people like, oh, I, I've been cooking Thanksgiving dinners and things for a couple of years. Nah, I need some decades on you. I need some decades. I just, recipes has been tried and true. Your recipe needs to have gone through, you know, a bad presidency and a good presidency. Uh, uh, <laughs> like, I need to go through the Bush era at least at this point. I need to have gone through the Bush era, Obama era to Trump era. Like, I need that level of experience. If you have not been cooking, if you've been, if you have not been cooking since Bush was president, I don't necessarily trust you to be doing catering. I need you to at least be at this point in time. You should have been hitting them pots during the Bush era. And I'm not talking about the first Bush. Of course not. I'm talking about George W. Bush era. If you have not been whipping pots since the George W. Bush era, I'm not ready for you yet. You got a little bit, you know, you might, you know, you might be a nice sous chef, but you can't be the Thanksgiving cook, the official cook. I, I need, I need that. You know what I'm saying? I need you to have been around during the Bush. And I don't care what part of the Bush era. It could have been the second term or the first term. But if you have not been whipping pots since the, old, the since the George W. Bush era, then you're not catering my Thanksgiving. Some people cannot claim that. Some people started, you know, at the end of Obama, which is fine for a four-person dinner. But if you try to take over Thanksgiving, the era, need, you need to at least have been around, you, you need to at least been cooking around that time. If you haven't done it that time, sous chef it is. And that's fine. Like me, sous chef. Easily. I'm easily a sous chef. I have no shame and what I do, what my contribution was to the dinner of Thanksgiving was the incredible charcuterie board that I made. Okay, I made a homemade charcuterie board. I brought the, I bought all the different cheeses. I paired them properly with the dried fruits and the nuts and the, the 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 feta stuffed olives and you know had some great wines. You know, I did that. That's what I brought to the table, literally. Um, but but Miss Don, uh, incredible. So we had a nice little spread. You know, Thanksgiving spreads are complicated because I see people do all types of interesting things. I, I see all these different things people can eat. I'm more of the class of keeping it simple, but keeping it soulful. What I mean is that I don't, I don't want to do a plate that's got too many things serving. I think that's why people stress themselves in the kitchen because they get too into the weeds. I just believe that the Thanksgiving needs to have a staple. I call it the rainbow plate theory. The rainbow plate theory is that, that, that your plate needs to have an array of different colors. And if you can hit the rainbow on your plate, then that means you've achieved what I think a Thanksgiving plate should look like. I call it the rainbow plate theory. What do I mean? I need to see some greens. I need to see different shades of colors. So the way I design my plate is, Okay, you have the turkey, you have the brown, you have the, you know, you have the, the turkey, that's the roast turkey. Hey, if you don't eat turkey, get beef. You got the protein, you got the meat. Then you got this nice stuffing that complements it. That's the light brown, right? You got to have that. Some good cranberry sauce. Now, see, let me tell you about me. I don't care about your homemade cranberry sauce. If that's what you want to make, that's what you make. But in my house, it's ocean spray, jellied cranberry sauce, none of the chunky stuff in the shit, just a clean, classic Chill, take it out, slice it nicely. It tastes good. I don't care what none of you all think about canned cranberry sauce. Canned cranberry sauce from Ocean Spray specifically is incredible, okay? It's refreshing. It does what it needs to do for the plate. 
Okay, so you have that nice dark, vi you know, violet color. So then you get to the macaroni and cheese. Macaroni and cheese is baked for me. It's just gonna be baked mac and cheese, three or more cheeses. That's how I do it. You got that nice golden color now. Now we gotta have a greens. Some of y'all don't do collard greens. It's fine. The collard greens I eat is in, um, we're gonna do a ham hock. Now some of y'all say, I don't like pork, so y'all do turkey butts. Fine, whatever kicks it off for you. You need to have some greens. And for some of y'all, green beans. Either way, but you got to have some green on the plate. Then we move on to, after that, you got, you know, whatever corn, muffins, and rolls you want. Um, oh, your orange. Sweet potatoes. You got to have yams. That gives you that orange on the plate. You got to have sweet potatoes. I just, you know, whether you want to call them yams, mashed, you got to have something like that on the plate. And then after that, you can do a roll and you're done. That's my salad. If you want to do deviled eggs for appetizers, you can do that. It's not required, but you can. Some of y'all like to do, um, some of y'all skip sweet potatoes and do mashed potatoes and gravy. Personally, I, I just, I feel like if you got the, the dressing or for some of y'all stuffing, whatever you got there, you should, that, that's the starch. I just sometimes, sometimes people just be doing too much. Like, I've gone places, I'm just like, you got a mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes, and stuffing. That's too much starch. And then let's not even talk about the mac and cheese. But I don't know why you would need mashed potatoes. Listen, so I've been on this rainbow plate theory for a long time. People remix it. People do different things. Some people replace their greens with um, Brussels sprouts. I don't care. Replace the greens with Brussels sprouts. But you need to have that color pattern for me. If I don't see that color pattern on a plate, it starts to be weird. Like I've seen plates where it's just turkey, mashed potatoes with gravy, and then stuffing with gravy. And I'm just like, that plate's too brown. Where is the green? Where are the greens? Where is the yellow? Where is the mac? Where you got to have some color. Because the color tells a story to me, personally. I saw some people for Thanksgiving had turkey and fried chicken. You know, food must have been good in Baltimore. I was just like, fried chicken, that's interesting. But you know, people mix it up a little bit. They add their little twist. Now, I know in the South, there are people in the South that add seafood. And y'all, some of you East Coasters are like, why seafood? Listen, that is a North Carolina thing. That is a Southern, that's a New Orleans thing. There will be a seafood element down South. Deep fried turkeys, East Coast, leave it alone. Don't touch it. Do not touch Cajun deep fried turkey. Leave it alone. Leave deep fried turkeys alone. Just... I don't even play like that over here. Like my 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 good Judy, my Miss Dawn, she just listen, she knows. She knows she's East Coast, she's Jersey baby. She just gives me a good solid soul food meal. I don't it don't gotta be too crazy. Some of y'all be trying to do too much. Now, some people can do one. My lawyer can do a good deep fried turkey. He likes the green egg. He's into the green egg. He's obsessed with the little green egg smoker. He he's a he's a smoking whiz. He knows how to do that. But again. Not too many of y'all can, and I'm not judging your pictures because I'm grown now. I don't judge Thanksgiving plates. Some of these plates, sidebar, some of these plates I feel like are fake. I feel like there are people that put bad, I mean, there are some people that I'm sharing, I'm seeing this, these memes, and I feel like people are purposely showing like horrible uncooked food to, to spark reaction. And that's annoying because now like the genuineness of viral moments on social media are no longer as intimate or as creative. I feel like every year there's like about one or two like really unique, real social media quote unquote scandals that are really interesting that are genuine. Nowadays, people just be promoting their own, they like make up scenarios to go viral. And you can just tell. And as somebody who's lived on the internet for like most of my life and definitely is one of the beginning forefathers of black Twitter. I I remember when the stuff used to be genuine. Now you can just tell, like it's like all these random pages, like no one knows who the person is. You know, like a good moment, a good example of a Thanksgiving, like a, a very viral moment that happened on social media, that blew up on social media, was the young black guy who ended up going to that white family's house like every Thanksgiving because it was like a, a confusing text message. And then he just kind of invited, they kind of invited him anyway, despite the confusion. And he's made it a point to go every holiday with that family. And it's been going on for like, I think over eight years. Like that was a real viral moment that was really authentic. Me going after Justin Timberlake and getting him together definitely was a random moment <laughs> and a very, you know, 
you know, real moment. Like that shit was real. That shit was not scripted. Like that's the thing. Like there's real authentic moments on social media. Then there's just moments where it's just like, you can just tell like all of those, all of the, the stupid date couple theories. Oh, this person took me to cheesecake factory and all these stupid, like that stuff is so manufactured. And like, You just know when it happens. The discourse that takes place following the quote unquote scandal of it all, that is real because people out here really be showing their asses with their dumb opinions. But the 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 cause, the cause and the basis for it, I just feel like it's a doing. It's like, come on. So I've noticed that there's been an increase of people creating these bad Thanksgiving dinner plates on purpose to to try to get people to you know, engage. I was just like, you don't have to do this for engagement. You can just be yourself. But I know it's some people was born to be themselves. So they have to be something else. But anywho, I, I just, yeah, for me, I just, I go with the rainbow plate theory. That's just my thing. If I don't, if I don't see the rainbow on the plate, it's not happening for me. Now there's all this conversation about low vibrational plates and all that nonsense a couple of years ago. People talk about low vibrational plates. <laughs> Bullshit. Um, <laughs> Thanksgiving is Thanksgiving, um, but it's it's a thing, you know, for me. I just I I gotta see the colors and variety. But I'm also again I'm a very everything on the plate has to make sense person. Because also too is it's like it's just be a bunch of stuff. Like I just see some people make them. It's like you don't need to do all of that. Like and be going in the kitchen and stressing. I was very happy dinner. Thanksgiving dinner was at. Six o'clock, six thirty. We 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 ate it around six six thirty. Look, what? Li- listen, I don't care that it was catered. You can have it catered, and you can still have a dinner at a decent time. I'm never going to look where I come from. We didn't eat anything the whole day until dinner. Now the charcuterie was the appetizing thing, like we had that, but we didn't eat all day. That's the that's the rule over here. It's it's. You don't eat anything for Thanksgiving except Thanksgiving. <laughs> and you, you know, there might be the little, you know, accompaniments at the beginning, but the dinner, the feast is the feast. Um, so yeah, dessert was the dinner was everything. So then dessert. I did catering there. I didn't make any pies. I got catering. A sweet potato pie from Honeysuckle Provisions, which is one of America's best new restaurants. Mm. Um, black owned, of course, not too far in West Philly, but Omar Tate and them made me a lovely sweet potato pie. And I had to have a sweet potato pie. So as a black person, y'all, I don't eat pumpkin pie. I never had it. I don't think I've ever had pumpkin pie. I'm not really into pumpkin pie. I just, I'm not that girl. I'm not really a pumpkin person. I, I just don't, it's just not for me. Now, other people live by it. Good, good to you all. But in this house, if you say sweet potato or pumpkin, it is, it is pumpkin for me. Um, no, sweet potato. Sorry. So for me, it's it's sweet potato um, compared to pumpkin. I, just no pumpkin for me. Um, but Omar Tate did a really great job with that pie. We also got, I did the most, I got three pies from Cake Life Bakery. Now, Cake Life Bakery, you know, they're not, you know, black owned and they're not black and they don't even pretend to be. They don't make sweet potato pie. They don't even try to. And I like that. I like when when white people just know what they do and do it well, Right. They made a great maple pecan pie that was really good. And then they also had an apple strudel pie. Oh, so good. Spiced well. Apples were done to perfection. And then there was also a really cool thing I wanted to try. And I loved it. It was a cranberry hazelnut tart. It was vegan. And it was a hit. I was surprised. I just thought it was cute to just add it to the to my list of things. But it was so good. And I and with my desserts. I do two types of desserts mentally. I go for the very sweet and and rich, you know, and I go for the fruity and fun. So my apple strudel pie with my cranberry tart complemented my maple pie, pecan pie with my sweet potato pie. Um, So it was a good vibe for everybody to, you know, get a little bit of savoriness of all that. It was really good. Um, Yeah. So desserts were phenomenal. I, I have no complaints about desserts for Thanksgiving this year. Lots of great red wine. Finally got to open up a really, really great bottle of red that my good Judy Kelly got me. Um, this bottle is called Alter e- it's called Alter Ego. And it was 2020 was the year it was bottled. So it was it was aged well. And it was just a really good, rich, luscious red. I'm obsessed. It was so good. I put in my decanter, let it do its thing. 
And it was great. It was great wine. We had so much good wine. It was such a good time. Shout out to my people who came. Of course, Jamarcus, Sharon, my younger brother, Mr. Johnson. It was a very chill, low-key, you know, Thanksgiving situation. I, I, I just love the peacefulness. We caught up and watched, you know, important TV. We didn't watch any movies, but we watched Zeus Network. Um, they had some really good important reunion reunions in television that we had to catch up on. It was it was it was great entertainment that we watched for hours on end. But it was very good. Um and, and the food was phenomenal. Um I didn't get the itis uh this time around. I, I was I had a nice pacing of sorts. Um, I didn't just crash. And I think maybe I didn't crash because I didn't do any cooking. <laughs> so I feel like the itis kicks in sometime. Well, it depends. The itis being, you know, when you eat a really rich meal like that, you can, you know, it will put you to sleep. Didn't put me to sleep. Someone else from the house fell asleep. You know that little take a break thing where they say, oh, just give me a couple of, give me a couple of minutes. And then it'd be like, Mr. Johnson. It was like a couple of minutes. Like, oh, give me a couple of minutes. So he was like, okay, okay. And then two and a half hours later, he he comes and the house is clean. The food is clean. Everything's, you know, settled. And I just, you know, I was like, wow. But, you know, I feel like that's how, that's going to be me during Christmas. Because Christmas, when I go down south, I will definitely be cooking. My mother does not play any of that catering shit, okay? She's very like, we we doing it, we doing it. And she does not play. So I will be cooking. I will, you know, my my catered Thanksgivings for, is, is only what I do. There's no catered Christmas. <laughs> she wants to cook everything. And we and I, and I do like cooking. And there is more, I have more about that story. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that much. I'm going to drop a little hint. But I have something sentimental that's coming out next month about my Christmas holiday cooking. There's a story about it and it's very sentimental and I am going to, yeah, I'll just leave that there, but there'll be more about that. I don't want to talk about it right now. It makes me a little emotional, but it will be coming out next month and I'll talk more in depth about it, but I don't, yeah, Christmas is, I, I, we have to cook on Christmas. We just cannot not cook on Christmas. So you know, I got to start doing a little bit of pre-mental about, like, how I want to cut things. Like, when you've been away from the kitchen for so long, you forget techniques and things. So, I got to, I guess I got to do a little bit of cooking around the house before then. And let's be clear, I can cook. You all know I can cook. You know, when we had, when I first moved into my new place, I did, like, a dinner series where I just cooked for my friends Myself and Mr. Johnson. It was like a thing we did every Sunday for like, I think this was like a cookie marathon that lasted for like three months. And I, we did everything from ducks, everything. We did this one to get familiar with our all of the cooking devices in our house. We, had, you know, when we got married, we finally last year opened all of those wedding boxes and gifts. So we had all these knives and forks and plating and all these machines and all this stuff. And so it was a way for us to get familiar with the feng shui of the of, of our place and also get familiar with the just cooking and using these things. And so it was a great exercise in understanding our flow and, and also figuring out what we needed to add. And we didn't need to add anything, actually. Like everything that we had in the house to cook all these extravagant meals, we did duck, we did different types of pastas, we did beef bourguignon. We did all kinds of things. We played with cast iron pots. We we did stainless steel. We did everything. But we had all the things we needed. We didn't really have to go out and really buy too many extra things to make whatever we wanted to make in the house. So there's no excuse for me to cook. Like, if I wanted to cook, I could cook. I just... Time, you know? I was looking at that Beyonce trailer, which we'll talk more about later in the podcast, but Beyonce said that she's up against time. That is her thing. She's just talking about time. And that's how I feel. I look at it like the only thing that I'm I'm doing is time. Like how much time do I allow myself to think and breathe, process and educate myself, meditate, but also just, you know, use it wisely. That's been something that's been big, especially since I've turned 32. Even since I've gotten in my 30s. Like I'm just not going back and forth with you. You know, I'm living my best life. I, I think about time. Like one thing I've realized that is my pet peeve is repeating myself. I hate redundancy. I don't like to repeat myself consistently about things that I've put 
time and energy into articulating the best of my abilities. Repeating myself is a no-no. I, I don't like um, bad faith actors. Like, no one should like bad faith actors. But what I mean is that there are people who like to waste your time. Like, either they like to talk in circles, they like to argue about the same moot points. And at some point, you just, when you know how people, where people stand on something, I'm not wasting any more time trying to convince them otherwise. I'll give you that one good final, you know, what I call the closer. But after I get past the closer, everything else is just you just wasting time. You just stuck in your ways. And that's not like a personal problem that's not going to require my personal time. And so I've been, I've gotten better with not, I'm, I'm just, I'm still, I'm still in some, in some spaces still doing a lit, doing it, but I'm recognizing how to reclaim my time. Seriously. Not just saying it because it sounds cute, but really reclaiming my time. Like, am I going to spend my time arguing and going down a rabbit hole with a person who was stuck on stupid? No. Honestly, you just got to let people see it. And you know what's funny is that when you do have your, you know, what I call your big one, you know, when you're standing on business, um, you get to a point where you're like, I'm not, I'm not going to keep explaining and defending things that I do and work that I do. Um, at all. I'm not going to, you know, keep um, doing anything that doesn't speak to my work and doesn't speak to my craft. Like we do so much, we spend so much time, you know, wasting our time um, trying to convince everybody everything um, for real, for real. So I'm just being more mindful of that. There was so many places I went to um, uh, before Thanksgiving that I was trying to get off my bucket list before I knew everything was going to go like bongos. So one of the places that I went to was Sparkling Pink. Love Sparkling Pink. Just want to put that out there. Sparkling Pink is this new spot at the Ritz-Carlton, um, which is in Center City downtown. It is a old cigar bar that used to be there. It's called the Vault. It's it's technically called the Vault. So if you go to the Ritz Carlton, the actual space, it's of course you know there's the main bar and the main lobby area. I'm not talking about that. You when you walk out to have to go to the bathroom, there's that private little room on the other end. Now they used to be like a cigar bar a couple of years ago, and then they didn't do anything with the space. They've now transformed it into this private speakeasy that's all pink inside. I mean, cocktails are pink. Everything's pink. I got a sneak peek. I got to check it out. Um, and it was it was an interesting experience because the thing was is that I actually was going to the Ritz Carlton to actually talk to somebody. <laughs> and let me clarify that. So let me just say this. If you've ever been to the Ritz Carlton at night, on a Thursday, Friday night, a late night, you will catch a couple elected officials there. If you know, if you keep up with tally score, you could catch like former mayor Michael Nutter in there. You can catch some state reps up in there. There's some regulars that go to the Ritz Carlton. And part of it, I think, is because it's like right across the street from City Hall, but it's also in the heart of the city. And so I was there to meet someone, an elected official. They will not be named, but I met them up there to catch up and get some tea. And what you know, the thing was, I was very low key. Like it was, I, I could have been going to some other event, but I didn't. But I was there to meet them. And so while while I was getting drinks and I was you know having my little situation, I saw this pink room, and I already knew because I was in the car. I was headed. I went to another event. Went, there was like so many events last week. So Comcast did this event with. Um, it was like a Christmas. Uh, holiday preview of what they got at the Comcast Center or something. So I went to that. It was cool. It was it was it was it was chill. Took a really good photo that you all loved apparently. That photo of me on the wood cabin. They had that display at at Comcast. And it's in the com that, that display is the Comcast building. So I took some good pictures. I was hanging out with my homegirl Laura. And when 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 it was time to leave, I had to head to the Ritz Carlton for my little, you know, private little meeting the thing was that while i was while i was riding with her i noticed that there was this 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 back room that was lit with pink lighting and i was like mm, it's pink in there and i could see it through the window but i was like the lights are on which means something must be going on 
So what ended up happening was that I met up with this person, you know, had my conversation. My favorite, co- one of my favorite cocktails in the city, just as random, is the guava sidecar. And I forget how good it is because it's at the Ritz Carlton. So when that was done, I was like, let me, let me, let me, let me peek and see what's going on in this room. And so I get my behind over there. I go inside. Well, let me clarify. I was recognized. And then they let me in. <laughs> but it wasn't open yet. And so there was like a the team, the people put it, I think they called the bucket listers. They were doing like a little photo shoot in situation. And I was like, oh, snap. So I hit up my boy, Josh, my lit brother, Josh, which we had plans to go to taste cheesesteaks right after my meeting. Like I was, I was checking off some bucket lists. I haven't been, I I had not been inside taste cheesesteaks since it's grand open. Like I didn't have a full seated experience. We're going to talk about that in a minute about taste cheesesteaks when I think about it. But at the time I was like, let me check this out. So luck, fortunately, I was able to come. They let me come in. They were already doing a photo shoot. So I was like, can I, you know, I told them who I was. They was like, sure, you know, but it was, everything was just like chill. It was like very, very, like people were like thinking like, oh, can I go in? It was like on some exclusive, but I kind of fell into using my, using my, using my like context clues and skills. I was like, they are in there. Somebody must be in there because the lights are on. I remember we was in the car and I was just like looking, I was like, Oh, wow. It was really pink in there. But like, why is it? Why is somebody in there? What's going on? And, you know, nosy can sometimes get you some news. And so I was able to quickly connect, you know, the Ritz Carlton people were there, the bucket listers. There was this influence that was there. I was able to get my boy Josh up in there. We had a good old little time. We got a little sneak peek. And so I was able to do this like really cool exclusive um, the next day that I was on it. I was like, this isn't even open yet. It it, 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 it it publicly went out to the public um, over the weekend. So like this past Saturday, doors are officially open for Sparkling Pink. It is basically this, like I said, private cocktail bar vibe. You have to make reservations. It's thirty five per person. But with your thirty five, here's the cool things: you get a you get a you get a welcome cocktail. You get to be there for an hour and fifteen minutes. Like it's like a it's like an experience. You get to get to have a, a guaranteed sit down in space for an hour and fifteen minutes. Um, there is a bunch of cool little snacks that are complimentary, and you get exclusive access to these other cool cocktails that you can buy to drink. So it's a really cool, dope idea. What a good use of like space that was not even utilized. And the cocktails, everything in there is pink. It's fun. They do this cool thing on Wednesdays. So on Wednesdays, we wear pink. So, you know, they encourage people to get discounted cocktails and fun stuff. It's all types of cool stuff that's going on. They're open in the daytime all the way to the evening. Um, I think their last time that you can make a reservation, I believe, is at like 10 p.m. Is like the last call time. So they got a late night vibe and they got a midday vibe. You could do an early little, you could turn into a cute little fun happy hour or you could do a little late night situation. But it's really, really fun. There's cool snacks. They have like macaroons and cream stuffed beignets and everything had like a nice little tangy and tartness to it. They had monk fruit trail mix. And it was, it was, it was definitely Ritz Carlton. It was definitely Ritz Carlton on a, on a different level. And it was barbecue. Like, it was definitely like something like that. I don't feel like, I mean, I think it would have always been successful, but since we're in this Barbie era right now, where a Barbie grows in a Barbie world, I think it's even more so that people are like into this like high pink, loud pink couture d- decor. And so it was a vibe. It was a vibe. Um, and I was very fortunate to be able to check it out because from what I'm hearing is certain weekends are already being sold out um, but it's, it's, it's a vibe. And apparently the prices also, this is another fun fact, the prices increase based on how late it is. So if you do an earlier time to do this with friends on a, on a, and you're doing it like on a random Wednesday, it might be 35, but it will go up based on what time. So if you go at an eight o'clock on a Friday night, it's not going to be $35. It might be a little bit more. Um, but the range is not too crazy, but it is a it is a range for sure. Um, no, I'm ex- I, I was very impressed. It was very fun. Definitely a standout. Now, 
I went to um, Taste Cheesesteaks. That's the place over there in around JFK. It's over there in that little plaza area that's next to the Comcast, across the street from the Comcast Center where Misconduct Tavern is. Over there on JFK, around that area. It's it's over there. It's low key. Now, let me tell you about this place. So, Taste Cheesesteak. It's black owned. They seem to be making a lot of money. Um, definitely a lot of energy. It's got, it's very, it's a small space. It's got like a night, it's like a, it's a bar, but it has like a loungy vibe to it. It's more bar than dining seating. I would be, if I was keeping 100. Um, I mean, it, for what its space is giving, it has the right amount of clientele, the right energy to keep the place active. And folks love come down there. It's 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 been created a vibe for sure. Um, the cheesesteaks. They definitely do different cheesesteaks. They have the traditional beef cheesesteak, right? But they and they everything they use is is Cooper Sharp Cheddar. Or I'm sorry, Cooper Sharp Cooper? Sharp Coop Cooper cheese. It's good. I like it. The cheese was good. I liked everything was Cooper. I like Cooper Sharp. Anything Cooper, I'm into it. So that was good. The portion sizes are big. And honestly, I recommend you sharing. It's not meant for one person. Now, if you own a greedy binge, you could, I guess you could do it. But I I feel like it's the type of if you go, you should split it. Like you should have one and the boo should have one half. <laughs> not you all get two. Um, the oxtail cheesesteak was incredible. It was definitely a standout. The oxtail cheesesteak was was great. Well seasoned, well flavored, very good oxtail meat. No bone in it, which was great. Very good, tasty cheesesteak. Cocktails were good. They had some. They have a they have a cocktail for everybody. is is very fun and festive. The bathroom is very interesting. Definitely a very high lighted, bright Art Deco. Um, definitely saw a lot of neon light writings that gave me an Atlanta vibe, um, for sure. That's not a compliment, but I would. But it was very. It, it's very. It's it definitely has a certain. It, it, they know who they're selling it to, and maybe that person may not necessarily be me per se. Um, but it definitely, definitely a, a certain, uh, definitely a certain energy. Now, what I will say is this. The food was good. The drinks were good too. I have no qualms with any of those things, but then prices, that was the thing that stood out to me the most because as a food writer, things, I, people said, People always ask me just on the side, like, you know, how come I've been really good at eater? Like, how I've been able to adjust and write? And I tell people that I write from the part perspective of a consumer. Like, my entry into the dining scene in Philadelphia was largely due to being a consumer. I went to a lot of restaurants. I've spent thousands of dollars, okay, of my own money dining out and eating out with my husband. Like, I've been doing this for 10 years, like, of just... Going out to restaurants because food is my love language. And that was our love language dating when we started. Like we used to hit restaurants every single week. It was always a date night, always a new restaurant. We couldn't cook in our dorm rooms. So we always wanted to experience. And we also wanted to get away from the pen bubble. And so restaurants downtown and across the city was our way of an escape. But it was also a way for us to get closer and to be intimate and have privacy. And it was just perfect, right? So I've been doing this restaurant thing for 10 years, I've been going to restaurants religiously for 10 years in this scene. I've seen the ups and the downs, the rise and the falls. Okay, I was around during the Sabraga rise and fall, right? If y'all don't know who Kevin Sabraga is, look him up. But he was one of my favorite all-time chefs. He had one of my favorite all-time restaurants in Philadelphia, which was Sabraga. But he also had the fat ham, which was incredible. And that Sunday supper is still unmatched, okay? But anyway, I've been around the scene. So I come at this with a consumer mindset. Like I know how much things should cost. I know when things are overpriced and over and, and also I know when things are over overpriced for profit versus actual artistry. So what I mean by that is, is that if you're paying $165 for a Friday, Saturday, Sunday tasting menu, you should 
And to be honest, I think it's a pretty good damn deal for what that man is doing in that restaurant. Just want to say that. But there are some places that's out here charging people $30 for a cocktail that really ain't nothing but a bunch of shit on ice. And therefore, yeah, no, I'm not. That's ridiculous. So I've I've seen the ranges of things, right? So let me explain what I think. Maybe it's because I feel like the prices are high. The prices are ridiculously high. So that oxtail cheesesteak I told y'all about, that John is $34. Yes, $34 for a cheesesteak. $34 it was. And yes, I know there was oxtail and all that jazz, but $34 for a cheesesteak, I'm sorry. That was a, a standout. The salmon, the jerk chicken, and salmon were in the mid-25s as well. I think the only thing that was not over 25 bucks was, I think, the original cheesesteak, just the regular beef, because he couldn't get away with that. You can't tell me anything about that steak that required it, okay? You ain't using no Wagyu, whatever. He it was it was it was regular cost for that. Those drinks, this man had that that taste cheesesteaks had cocktails that were over $22. A lot of their cocktails were like $18, $22. And these were not no, you know, um, what, what, what's, what's the word, like Hard Rock Cafe, where they have the big ones and the cute little glass. You can take the glass home and you got the got the straw. No, nah, it wasn't one of those. These are regular, regular cocktails that this man is serving for $22 and $18. Now, let me tell you what had me gagging. Now, this is the real gag. The gag is, is that he has a half, the, the owner in the, the, the shop, Taste Cheesesteaks, has a happy hour that is on weekdays that goes till 8 p.m. And they don't do it, I believe, on weekends, but they do it throughout the week. They have a happy hour that starts and ends at 8 o'clock p.m. And it's half off drinks till 8 p.m. Now, at first, I was like, wow, an 8 p.m. happy hour, that's lit. So Josh and I thought. But when I looked at the prices of those of those drinks, I said, oh, this man is playing games. Because if you look at it, right, $22, you cut that in half, that's 11 bucks. That's how much them drinks are supposed to cost. That $18 drink is $9 to eight. That's how much it's supposed to cost. And his regular hours throughout the week is over, I believe, around 11 or midnight. So I'm thinking to myself, oh, well, well, see, you are never feeling the burn because most, like for me, I personally, I would never go there like late for myself. Like if I went, I would go at a, like a five o'clock, six o'clock hour. Them cheesesteaks need to be having happy hour special if you ask me. But, <laughs> but the drinks is the killer. So the drinks is half off. And you're thinking you're getting a deal. Now, first of all, I hardly know that many places do half off cocktails. But I'm looking like, well, when the, when the goddamn cocktails are $22, they should be 50% off. But then I'm like, that's the average cost of a drink anyway. Like most drinks in Philadelphia, most drinks in Philadelphia are under $15. Most at a decent restaurant. If your cocktails are over $15, I'm looking at you a certain type of way. I don't believe, I, I just don't. I, I'm, again, I've gone out to many restaurants. I've been around the block. I feel like if you have any cocktail that's over $15 that is not at a hotel, because let's keep it 100, or, or not at a Sky Lounge. So I, let me be clear. I'm not talking about like hotels, like a Ritz-Carlton, Ritz-Carlton, I don't know if they have any drinks. I mean, they have maybe a couple under 15, but Ritz-Carlton is a hotel. You know, hotels jack up costs for various reasons. I'm not talking about hotels, and I'm not talking about exquisite rooftops, okay? I know there's going to be some things there. But if you got me in a plaza on JFK right next to Misconduct Tavern and you playing in my face, I'm going to walk. I'm going to go right to Misconduct Tavern. You could literally skip all that and go to Misconduct Tavern. You got competition right on your strip. Like, I, I mean, when I went in there, I mean, granted, I want to support and I did support the, 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 the cheesesteaks were, you know, they were good. I'm, I'm not taking that away from that place. But if you think about what you're doing and how you're doing, it's a lot going on. 
$11 for a mule. Listen, Pete, listen, I, I mean, I don't know. It's, they, they, he was bragging, the owner was bragging, saying they're making some 500000 in the past few months. They're making some big bank. But what I really think it is, though, is that he is charging club, nightclub prices and lounging. And I don't understand why, because the space isn't that big to do all of that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's, there's a certain group that I feel like coming in there and they're using cash. And their mindset is like, you know what? I mean, I got it. I don't want to eat anything else. This is what I like. And he knows his base. And maybe I'm just not the base because I go out too much and I know it shouldn't cost that much. I just, I don't know. I want to see, I mean, right now they're hot. It's a hot spot. It's fairly new. So I feel like people are really, you know, big on it. And, you know, that's to be like, I think about, some family members I have that they will just, they, they want the nicest car. They'll have the dopest outfit. But when you look at their eating habits and what they into eating, it's, it's a very, it's, it's night and day. It's like, so you mean to tell them you got this rolly on your wrist. You got this cute little car, but you want to go to Waffle House? The fuck? And there's nothing wrong with Waffle House. I'm just saying like, it's like basic. This is for people who have the most basic taste. But there was, spit, but there's a client said there's somebody who understands. He's a listen. The owner is a is a shrewd businessman because he knows the clientele, which is this group is then people who are going to want to. This is what I call steak houses and cheese steak and pizza galore. They only it, to them fine dining is going to a steakhouse and it's a chain and they're and they're and they're they're dropping crazy money on a crazy cheese a crazy steakhouse because they think wining and dining means steak and only steak right and they're going to a place like that I'm not gonna name I'm not gonna call no names but they're going you know what steakhouse they're going to there's two of them that they're going to they only go to two of them they think if they go to those two oh my goodness. And their way of describing everything they eat is called phenomenal. Everything's phenomenal. There's no great, good, fine, wonderful. It is phenomenal. And that's, that's the way they live, right? So they go to the steakhouses. That's all they go to because that's their only vantage point of what fine dining or what good eating should be. They go to steakhouses. And then when they're not going to steakhouses, they want to go to some cheesesteak, John, that is going to like be like full of cheesesteaks that are like really good top tier. That's their comfort zone. That's just all they want to do. And I'm not judging those people in their basic taste. What I'm saying is, is that there is groups of people in Philadelphia that they only do steak houses or cheesesteak spots or seafood spots, like places where they could get some crab legs and some shit. That is it. That is all they're going to do. To them, they think lobster mac and cheese is like the holy trinity of fine dining. Like, they will tell you and brag about it. Like, you know how I know? Because I go to a black barber shop, and all of the men that go to that shop, whether they are 25 or 40 fucking five, and if you ask them what they did over the weekend, their date night is always a steak situation. And I'm going to be funny with it. They either go to Steak 48 or Del Frisco's. <laughs> Ocean Prime, maybe. But those are the only steak houses they're going to. And they're like, oh, we went out, man. I took the girl, Mrs. Out. You know, it was phenomenal. And it's like, everything's phenomenal. And it's, it's all they do is steak. That's it. Now, some of them might have a girlfriend or a wife that might try to challenge them to eat something different, but they don't like it. They don't want to go there. They don't want to go to Soraya. They're like, mm mm, mm mm, that's not, I don't know what that was. I don't like it. They would rather spend it on a steak. They want a big tomahawk steak, and they just want to tell you about how they spent $150 on some tomahawk for two, and they really think that that's the finest dining. And the crazy thing is, is that as a, as a food, person, as a restaurant critic, as somebody who does all of this type of work, I will tell you, I tell some of these brothers, I'm like, you know, you spent a lot of money for that, but you know that there's some places that have way better food and you can get so many crazy better deals. So, but they don't, that's not what they want. They don't want a tasting menu. They don't want, they don't want that. They want a seafood tower. They want their steaks and they want to be in a place that looks grand. And listen, I get it. I get it. They in love with Lock Bar right now, baby. They are Lock Bar, they are Snake 40 and Del Frisco. That's all they doing. <laughs> and they doing a cheesesteak spot. So this place is made for that person. 
Because they ain't mind like, oh, I got the new oxtail John. You know what I'm saying? It's real decadent. They got the truffle. They love that. They live for that. They live for that. That, that there's, they, they don't care because they want to be where it's hot. And they're in Center City and they at the they they that's what they're into. So they're gonna spend money that don't make any sense because that's the clientele. He knows his base. I'm not the base. And that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. But I just know that there is a there is a demographic of consumers that he's appealing to, and that's what it's for. So for some of my people that's listening to this, my basic listen is not, I'm jo- I, and let me say this, I'm teasing, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Because I know how some people get real sensitive. I'm saying to my people who fit in that category unapologetically, okay, because the dudes in my barbershop, they, listen, they unapologetic. They looked at my store, they said, I saw you was at this real cheesesteak place. What's that place called? I'm looking like, well, they serve it there. They got oxtail cheese. They didn't even care about the price. They just want to be there. Like, they wanted to be there or they want to be at the steakhouses. They saw me go to Lock Bar and Steak 48. They, that's all they was hype about. They didn't care about, you know, <laughs> Soraya. They didn't care about any of the fun places I went to. They don't care about Honey Sucker Provisions. They, they don't they don't care about my Lou. They don't care about any of that. Okay, her supper club. They're like, her who? What? No. They won't do it. <laughs> they won't go there. They want to go. That's what they want to do. Okay. Every blue moon, you might convince them to go to a really nice, classy Italian restaurant. But outside of that, they are sticking to their seafoods, their steak houses, their cheesesteak spots. And this is what he did for them. So that is my read. <laughs> it has been a long time since I've been critical. Because uh, a lot of restaurants just been damn good this year. But there's some places... Every, every, every so often, I find myself somewhere and I just, I just have to let it out. And look, it's not bad. I think people should see for themselves, but <sighs> so speaking of places and eating, um, the Morris, which I end up circling around. Remember I told you how much I love the Morris last time? Y'all, the Morris is just such a cozy spot. I went back again. Less than a month later, I'm back at the Morris. This time, because they have a Sunday supper special that is the bomb. So every Sunday evening, they have this summer supper situation. And I'm telling you, this is a deal. They are doing a two for $60 three course meal. It's an apple, it's a salad. It's a main course and it's a dessert. And they have a $25 wine pairing that you can add on for the experience. Where are you going to get that at? Where? Where are you going to find that at? Like what? So Mr. Johnson and I went for a lovely Sunday supper. It was great. They had this really great roast pot roast situation. Great fresh salad. That is delicious. Um hazelnut um, dose ice cream with the syrup and the wine pairing was great. Oh, I loved it. A very affordable dinner. And like, we are not leftover people. We didn't have too many leftovers. We told all of our guests who came to bring Tupperware. We told people, bring Tupperware. We was like, bring Tupperware. Like, please. And everybody did. Everybody brought Tupperware. Everybody packed up they, they stuff because I was just like, I'm not a leftover person. Like, I really don't like that many leftovers. We had a really great turkey noodle soup <laughs> that we used with um, some, some. we had a mix. That actually was like chicken. Was it, it was chicken and, and turkey. So we had some turkey leftover. So we used that for the soup. Um, I think there was enough leftovers for one. I had one solid um, meal after. But after that, that's it. The leftovers are gone. The, the, they're gone, gone. So... We're now, you know, in a, you know, we can go back to eating. Like Saturday night, I had uh, got Santucci's pizza. And then, you know, the Sunday supper at the Morris was just great. But I'm back on to regular eating. Like, I don't like to hold on to Thanksgiving leftovers too long. There's some people that make it a thing where they eat it for weeks and weeks and weeks. That's how my mama is. I feel like whenever I go home, we'll have Christmas. But then it's like we literally eat leftovers up until New Year's. And then New Year's... It becomes a brand like New Year's Eve becomes. Of course, you gotta re, you gotta cook new food because you gotta have the black eyed peas, you gotta have the greens, you gotta have all that stuff. So it's like always one thing after the other, and so it's just like finding that that connection, man. It's just a lot. 
Hum, 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 hum. Oh, I'm drinking this um, Happy Bing, which has become my go-to. Um, it's this really great uh, tea. Um, it's a white tea brand that is really, really good. Um, you can order online. It's Tea with Benefits. It's called Happy Bing, and it's really good. It's really good for you, apparently. Um, they have, like, five all-star nutrients. They have elderberry, vitamin D3 for immune support, Petro and turmeric to promote inflation reduction. EGCG delivers gut and digestive health. They have all the ingredients. It's really good. I I found out about this when I went to over the summer. There was an influence event I went to, and they had these bottles. They gave everybody in there a bottle of this um, happy being. And I tried it and I was in love. And I said, you know, I really got influenced by the influence. <laughs> I was definitely under the influence. I was like, oh, let me try this. And I tried, I was like, wow, this is life changing. Mm, 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 mm. But moving along, you know, I'm getting ready for Sagittarius season. Sag Sagittarius or Sagittarius? Sagittarius. Terrorist. Um, Sagittarius, I guess, are having their season. And so, you know, I'm getting ready. Black Friday? Who? What? I didn't do Black Friday this year, really. I didn't. Now, let me clarify. It wasn't because of any political stances, but I, I just didn't feel like giving America, American democracy. Well, let me be quiet. I didn't do I didn't do Black Friday. Um, but for whatever reason, it just didn't feel like a Black Friday moment or anything. Like, I didn't... I, I, Many, 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 many years ago before I was um, with Mr. Johnson, I used to go, I used to have to go home for Thanksgiving because literally I had no other place to eat or stay in Philly outside of campus. Like I, you know, so I used to go home and part of my time was like, one, it was Thanksgiving. And then the, the, like right after that night, I want to say it would be like nine o'clock at, um, it'd be like around nine after dinner. You know, we would take a nice little nap in the evening. We'll have dinner around six or around five or six, take a good old nap, get up around nine, head over to the outlet. Now, this is in Katy, Texas. We was in Houston and Katy. So we would go to the malls and we'd be the first ones in there and we would stock up and also stay glocked up because people like to rob people. During Black Friday, it's a lot goes on. But we used to be those people. We used to do the Black Friday shopping, go to him up the malls, get the deals. But, you know, I just feel like, what is a deal, you know, in this economy? <laughs> like, I'm like, if it's not over 30%, I'm not here for it. If you got 20% off, nobody cares. It don't matter. Unless you got places that don't have sales tax. But 20% off ain't enough. 25% is not enough. A quarter is not enough. A third. A third or higher. If you're not doing higher, if you're not doing higher than thirty-two percent off, I'm not taking it seriously. I need to feel a real deduction, um, and so I really, you know, this 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 year, I, I just I, I did get a couple of things, not really for Black Friday, but I got a lot of friends who got birthdays coming up. I got all the Sagittarius in my life. I got all the Capricorns. I just had to make sure I had to get stuff early, so I definitely did a little bit of shopping. But not for black, not like in the way that like I would for for things. It, the stuff that I got, a lot of them things were not on sale. I just wanted to get them because I recognize these birthdays are coming. Like December is about to be nuts. And then Christmas is on the way. And then, you know, January going to have a bunch of birthdays. So I like to get ahead. So I said, let me get a couple of things now and, you know, do some cool stuff. And I want to be creative I've always, like, I've realized now my new thing is I have to come up with creative gifts. I just can't just, you know, give people, you know, a gift card. Um, not, now, now, I love gift cards for me, but I just, I don't, I don't know. I, I just feel like I don't, I can't give my friends gift cards. I just feel like I can't give them gift cards. Because, one, I don't really know. They, I mean, I guess I know a couple of things they like, but I just feel like I should give something that has a little bit more pizzazz. So I found the thing that I'm doing and it was actually inspired by one of the listeners of this podcast. Don't know when 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 it comes around time, but one of you all inspired me to do something. And I actually took it seriously. And I actually did it. And I love it. And I'm excited about it. And so I can't wait for y'all to find out what it is. Um, but yes. Um, yeah. I, this has just been a week. Um, 
Other places I want to shout out, um, Walnut Street Cafe. I caught up with a friend I haven't talked to in years. I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't make them a friend, huh? Well, someone who I was really close with, but, you know, they disappeared and I caught up with them. Oh, it's not a, it's not a she, it's a he. Um, it's not any people you would think it is because, no, them people I let go for real, for real. No, but I had a, a friend uh, many years ago who who moved out of town and moved back to Philly. And so me and him caught up and we went to lunch at Walnut Street Cafe. And I just want to just give them a shout out. Walnut Street Cafe, I, I, we sleep on her sometimes. We sleep on Walnut Street Cafe. We sleep on them. They are like, for me, because I live in university, I live in West Philly University, I live in that area. They are, you know, I always go all the way downtown for lunch. And people always ask me, where can I go for lunch? Where can we go for lunch? And I'm always picking some of these like really dramatic places. But I forget that Walnut Street Cafe is just right there. And sometimes you don't want the craziest, most extravagant lunch. Sometimes you just want a good solid salad and soup a good sandwich, get something, something solid. And they just did that for me recently. I went there um, right after Thanksgiving and just had a nice little lunch. It was real light. It was real relaxed. It was real chill. Everything was just good there. Highly recommend. If you're just looking for a chill lunch spot, you're looking for somewhere that's not too wild and noisy and too much, Walnut Street Cafe. Just get a nice little spot. They got good soup. They got soup, really good Good portion soup for under $10. I think their soup was like $8. It was decent. The salad is, oh my God, I have a really good salad on the menu. They have some good salads too. And you can add proteins or whatever you want to it. It was just really good. I forgot how good it is. So shout out to, to you know, the the great, the great um, <laughs> uh, Walnut Street Cafe. So yeah, those are all the places and things I did. I guess I did do a lot during Thanksgiving. Weekend. I mean, for starters, if you're listening to this episode, I am teaching my final class of the semester. Um, give y'all a little cool update on that. I am coming back for spring at Cheney University. You know, the contract, you know, you know, got renewed. My book will be the second half of my book will be taught in the second semester. Um, so we had a fall book. Um, four chapters for the case of accounts culture. The you know the book is eight chapters, so the they did four chapters of the book for fall. They're gonna do the final four chapters in the spring, and it's gonna all come together. So I'll be back to teach it. I'm looking forward to my students. I'm looking forward to teaching my students. Um, you know, some of, I'm so popular that apparently registration has been in has been wild for my class. Like people, some of my students I taught. The last semester, this this current semester, they want to come back and have me for the second semester. And then there's a bunch of other students who heard about me and I didn't want to take me for the second semester of the course. So I'm coming in high demand. I'm coming in high demand. Uh, and I look forward to it because it, it, these, these students have been great. It's just been really great being able to take this book to infinity beyond. Definitely a, a strong highlight of the year. And yeah, their final class for me is going to be this Monday. After that, they have finals and papers and things, but my class doesn't require all of those things. They Their assignments were all due up until. So the final day is 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 Monday, and I, I look forward to telling them what their final grades are. And uh, yeah, so it should be fun. Um, but yes, so into the news, into what's going on, these hot topics. A lot is going on right now. Um, for starters, I don't know what's going on with, with Biden, but, you know, it, it was Biden is apparently Biden, who is a pre-boomer, is losing the young voters that Democrats need. That is what's being said. Um you know, he's been making these interesting jokes. You know, people talked about him pardoning um, a turkey. He made it clear that he was, you know, not there at the first pardon. He made some jokes, but he basically, one of the things that happened was that there was like this weird generational gaffe where he conflated Beyonce's tour with Taylor Swift's tour and then later called Taylor Swift, referred to Britney, Britney, referred to Taylor Swift as Britney Spears. It was a lot going on. And it was a lot. And so he's he's getting a lot of heat right now. You know, he made a joke on Instagram about the, the, the issue. Basically, this happened on his birthday. And he basically, he's 81 years old. And he said, turns out 
on your 146th birthday, you run out of space for candles. And so they got a bunch of candles on the cake. And the fire on the cake was so many, so much fire that it looked like it was a bonfire. And so it was almost like it was mocking his birthday and mocking his age and poking fun. Um, and, you know, it, the because people are basically, the widely held perception has been, even in opinion polls, that people think that Biden's too old for another term. Um, and so he's, he's, it's interesting. He's been cracking jokes, but unfortunately, rather than people laughing about the joke on Instagram, a lot of people have been really criticizing his support for Israel. Um, people don't know if the Israel-Hamas war will be a major top of my issue for American voters as they go to the polls. You know, we're less than a year away from the 2024 presidential election. And, you know, people are trying to wonder about the economy. Um, you know, people think his handling Israel has weak support. Even Democrats don't like the way he's handling the issue. And Democrats rely on young voters, you know. A lot of them said, they, people have said it, uh, pundits have said they would have gotten crushed you know, without younger voters. You know, the disagreement over the way Israel is being handled right now. Um, it, a lot of people are talking about Michigan, which has a huge Muslim population. There is some anecdotal evidence there that college campuses and students are feeling some type of way. He needs Michigan. Um, people talked and they said that they won't be doing so this year to support him. They're not supporting Trump, but they just say they just not, they're not going to vote at all or they may just vote for a third party candidate. And, you know, he predates the baby boom as well. You know, he was born in 1942. This ain't nothing to sneeze at. You know, the baby boomer era is from 1946 to 1964. We've had boomer presidents. You know, we've had Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Trump. They were all born in 1946. Interesting enough, which is the first year of the baby boom, which is interesting. Obama is a boomer. Um, which, you know, he was born in 1961. However, people always say that it's, it's, you know, people say that, you know, Obama has, has written of not really identifying as a baby boomer. One, cause he's on that cusp, right? 1964 was the final year, but he was born in 1961. He is a boomer, but he, he kind of distances himself from that. He thinks he's more of a Gen Xer, but he really isn't. I don't, I don't think he's a Gen Xer. I feel like there's an element of him that's still, you know. But, you know, it's it's interesting. I feel like if you was born after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you are a Gen Xer. You come into a different cultural generation. And I feel like that matters, you know. Um, I see what the years are. It's like World War II, the Civil Rights Act 1964. Then 1964 on down, there's a different type of cultural difference there. And then millennials, of course, have it differently. But, you know, because we're like the MTV generation, as they like to call us. Because we came in with the, with the, you know, we millennials were birthed into the society where MTV and all those things happened. I believe it was like 1984, 1981, 1981, I believe. And Beyonce was born in that cusp era. So it's different. Um... But I don't know. I, I don't know. Biden is struggling. And a lot of this, we're in this weird predicament right now. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I've just been observing and hearing things. I, I just need people to rec recognize that unless there is a serious movement to consider another alternative, it needs to happen or it's Biden or bust. I'm sorry. I can't, I can't allow Trump to get back in. I'm just not going to do it. Am I crazy about Biden? No, I'm not crazy about him. But I can't have Trump get back in. And so for a lot of my young folks, it's like, I don't want to vote for Biden I hear you, but understand that if you think Biden is bad, you already know what Trump is. And it sucks that we have to keep doing a lesser evil situation. It is getting frustrating. But don't worry. Our time to take over is coming soon. And we need to just have some political leverage 
to be able to get leverage. There could be an opportunity here where the young voter population can make some demands of Biden. Let's talk about the student loan situation again. There's got to be another way. Let's 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 really leverage, you know, some some changes in some foreign domestic policy potentially. But there has to be at this point, he needs us to win. And if that's what he needs to win, then we have created our own voter base. I mean, I know black women, you know, really was able to get some demands made in the 2020 uh, presidential election. I mean, having a black woman vice president as a candidate, even though it was Kamala, it's it was a big nod to recognizing the power of black women voters. There's still more concessions that need to be made for that voter group. But I also think now young voters specifically need to see some policy that that supports their needs. I'm talking about jobs. I'm talking about student loan adjustments. I'm talking about some real serious skin in the game because if young voters don't show up to the polls, the Democrats will lose big time, okay? I feel like Republicans and conservatives have really given up on the young vote. They know that they are not going to appeal to that group. They just know, right? They're not going to waste their time, my time, our time, anybody's time, right? They know what it is. And because they know what it is, they, 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 they've they already have found a diminishing group of people that will only be able to support them if we don't show up. So there has to be a moment where even though you don't like him, do you do you want to see can you can you afford cuz Mark Lamont Hill's talking about some we can afford we cannot afford another Trump presidency. We cannot. Because if you think that Biden is annoying, Trump is the end. He's he is literally has the strongest possibility of going to jail. He gets back in the White House, he's protected for another four years. He's he's protected for another four years. If if we if, if he does not, if, if he gets this White House, he's protected. And the Supreme Court, baby, you can forget it. The same people that was crying. When Roe v. Wade got turned over, might be the same people that might not show up to the polls in 2024. Make it make sense. Make it make the fuck sense. Because I'm taking it personal. Because I know that the conservatives are now trying to reverse Ogreberfeld versus Hodges. They are trying to reverse gay marriage. They they are gonna they're coming for that next. It is on the docket. They want to take that and challenge that and fuck with that. And I'm not going back into the closet. And my rights are not going back to the closet. So you young voters, us millennials and Gen Z, look get your get get the fuck out your fillets and look at the bigger picture. Because look, I get it. Biden this, Biden that. But I'm telling you right now, if Trump gets reelected because we didn't show up to the polls. And I get it. You all can say, well, Biden got to do better. Yeah, 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 he do. But the reality is that politics and things do not shift overnight. And we know that. And at the end of the day, I can't afford another Trump presidency. So unless you all pull out an alternative, which you're not because you don't like anybody. Y'all don't like nobody. And no third party candidate is going to win. Sorry, it's just not happening. Jill Stein can have great speeches and beautiful gowns. Cornell Cornell West can keep trying to talk about everything else other than the child support he owes. We can talk about all these things, but these people are not going to win and it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen right now. And the reality is that if you all invested this energy into local races, now in Philadelphia, we have. Philadelphia have officially elected two third party candidates for an at-large city council seat. Philadelphia is about that life, but the rest of the country is not like Philadelphia. And quite frankly, Philadelphia needed some change because we still pop. So there are some things, right? But we got to see. We got to see. But I, I don't want to hear people saying they're not voting in 2024. I just feel like that ain't the way. That's not the way. If you tell me not voting in 2024, you are succeeding to Trump. You're giving Trump exactly what he wants. And if you're giving Trump what he wants, you're not giving me what I want. Because I want to preserve my rights and I can't afford 
to make these decisions. If you can afford not to vote in protest, that's assuming that everything that you are fighting for right now, you okay with letting it slide. I'm done. I just, I feel like that just needs to be said. We're also seeing a turnaround with a lot of people. A lot of Congress people are announcing they're not running for re-election. Some big names is Anna Ishu from California, been there for 30 years as a Congresswoman. She is now announcing she's not running for re-election. Republican Bill Johnson of Ohio is not running for re-election. Another uh, Congressman from California, Tony Cardenas, also announced he's not running for re-election. Um, next year. Now, Congress people have a two year term, so they run every two years. That must be exhausting to be a Congress person because the Senate, you get six years in the Senate. President, you get four years. But if you are running as a Congress person, you run every two years. That is exhausting. Um, speaking of exhausting, George Santos thinks he's going to finally be ousted from Congress. He thinks they're going to give him the boot soon because his stuff, his time is... But what's crazy is that this man is... is, is Re-election is coming, but they want to get him out of there sooner than later. So I'm here with it. He thinks it's about to be over. I think it's going to be over too. The streets are talking. We see where this is going. You know, it is what it is, right? But the biggest T that came out recently is this Michigan Senate race, Okay. Now, Michigan Senate candidate, okay, Hill Harper. He's a Democrat. He's running for USC to Michigan. Y'all know Hill Harper. Hill Harper, the great actor. He was such a good actor at one point in time. He wrote that really great book called Letters from My Father. That was so good. Um, was that him who wrote that thing? It was Hill Harper. Um, he's an interesting guy. Um, Letters to a Young Brother was his book. Letters to My Father was by... Um, um, Obama, but Letters to a Young Brother is from Hill Harper. I remember reading that book when I was younger. It was a class. It came out in 2006. Yeah, I was a, I was about 10 to 11 years old when that came. No, 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 I was no, 14, 15. Yeah, I was like 14, 15 years old when that book came out. I read it when I was in, 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 in high school, freshman. It was a good book. It was, it was called Letters to a Young Brother, Manifest Your Destiny. It was a really good book. Man, that that book was classic, and if you every, every I think every child should read it. Um, it was so thoughtful. Hill Harper is a genius. He's an actor, but he's a Harvard grad. He's a lot of things. He's he's yeah, yeah. He he's he's written multiple books, and um, have got an NAACP award nominations. He's written some great self help books. He's a nice guy, very very smart guy. I was just. I just remember him. So now he's running for office um, and he's running for, um, you know, he's 57 years old, which is wild to me. I didn't realize he's 57. He was in CSI. He was in The Good Doctor. He was in a couple of, you know, shows and, and things. Um, I didn't even know that, like, that he was, yeah, he was on a lot of TV shows. He was in Limitless. Um, he went to Brown University for his bachelor's degree, and then he got his he got his uh, MPA in JD from Harvard University. He's so smart. Yeah. I, oh my goodness, I, I had such a I had such a crush on him when I was younger. Um, he was in Spike Lee's Get on the Bus, which was about the Million Man March. He was in Mary with Children on TV. Um, he was in Beloved. He was in uh, The Visit, which was a very Serious independent film. Um, very, very good film, actually. Um, yeah, he's, he's done a lot of good work. So the tea about him, why I bring him up. Um, basically, he said he was offered $20 million in, a camp, in campaign support if he agreed to end his Senate bid and instead go against Rep. Rashida Tlaib. Now, she, Rep., this Rep., she is, uh, Rashida Tlaib, she is a part of the squad. And she is, um, you know, a congresswoman who is a part of the squad. She's the only Palestinian American member of Congress. And there's been a lot of scrutiny and criticism of her uh, based on her criticism of Israeli government's military operations against Hamas. It went even so far that the House passed 
a GOP-led resolution to censor her over her comments. Now, he did not um, name uh, the donor when he put this on Twitter. Um, but his campaign spokesperson, spokesman, um, base identified Michigan businessman Lyndon Nielsen, uh, Nelson as the person who offered this financial support. Now, various people are saying that they are trying to run against her, but he said he would not. He said, quote, he would, I won't be bossed, bullied or bought, he said, and he's not going to do it. Now, this is a big deal about the censor that happened to um to Rashida uh Talib Talib. Now, this is a rare thing, right? Um uh, people need to understand what's been going on. Um the House blocked a vote, voted to block a resolution from GOP Marjorie Taylor Greene to censor her last week. Um this was after, but then Green put up a new version of the resolution that drops a reference to a pro 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 Palestinian protest at the Capitol as insurrection, um, which had made some Republicans uncomfortable. That's apparently um, what made them upset. But apparently the resolution has been expected to have more support from Republicans because the language is narrower and more tailored to recent events. There was some politics around what was said. Um, she made a reference that's controversial. Now, Now the Anti-Defamation League says that the chant, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. They consider it an anti-Semitic slogan because they said that it's a rallying cry that has for that has long been used by anti-Israel voices, including supporters of terrorist organizations such as Hamas. Some people also say that in reference from the river to the sea, this line. This line was also used by Mark Lamont Hill many years ago when he was speaking at the UN, and that's what ended up leading to him being fired from CNN. The reference of why people think it's anti-Semitic is because when they say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, they assume that they interpret that as saying that that from the river to the sea is where Israel is, that you're asking for the, cons the, con the, the consistent wipeout of Israel um, when you say from the river to see, that means it's that it's it's like almost like a genocidal remark. That's ironic. Um, but almost like you're asking to push out an entire group of people um that are there. And so they consider anti-Semitic. Now, I'm just curious, and maybe curiosity will kill the cat. But one would argue that the interpretation of Palestinians is that they feel like currently they're 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 facing a wipeout, and so what is it called to support an area land that is leading to their demise? I don't know. Is that anti? Is that Islamophobic? Is it anti-Muslim? Is it anti-Palestinian? I don't. I mean, what would be the? I mean, both of them. I mean, is it is it, is it a two state solution people are asking for? I just I just trying to understand like if it's not if if one if one vantage point of that is from the river to the sea they're saying they're not free in that land, and if people consider that to be anti Semitic to Jewish people because it are arguably is saying it doesn't acknowledge their existence, then what is the current notion that is suggesting that Palestinians should live peacefully in Israel or in this? territory of land. I just I just think when we're calling something anti-Semitic, I just wonder what is the all what is in in the pursuit of not being anti-Semitic and saying that reference, then if you're not saying anything about any level of freedom for this group of people, then what is the alternative to say peace? Do you just say freedom for Palestine without saying from the river to the sea? Because if you say if you if you take that language out and you say free for Palestine, is that considered anti-Semitic? Is being pro-Palestinian anti-Semitic? I just I just wonder. Because, because at some point you have to make sure that the things that you're saying is articulate enough to not conflate. And there's been conflation. And I'm not defending from the river to the sea. If if that's the way it's been understood for so long and people feel like that's what it suggests then we can use other ways to describe it. I, I don't use any of the languages, to be clear, um, because, again, I, I I typically, you know, 
I stay in my lane and observe what was being where and where and how, right? But in to be clear, people are asking for freedom for Palestine that do not use that term and just say freedom for Palestine. Is that anti-Semitic? Because if people consider that anti-Semitic, what's going on here? It's been interesting observing. And I've been sitting and listening and learning. And just seeing some things that is clearly, as this conversation evolves, people are starting to notice some things. And some stuff needs to be clear from certain sides that are making declarations. Listen, as a black person who has called things white supremacy and racist, I can articulate and make it very clear what those things are and why they're the way they are. And I just remember that, you know, when I was on the other side of the fence, when it came, when, it, when I was, when there was a racial uprising, there were groups of people who interrogated any reference of white supremacy or racism. And now people are expected to just accept any claims and allegations about certain experiences as such without any interrogation or whether it's not. There's a double standard is what I'm trying to say. There's a double standard of if we say this is what it is, shut up and just believe it. And no one's supposed to say, well, wait a minute, well, how, why, right? But when it came to racism in America and when it came to those issues, every single time I said something was racist, I was asked to provide substantial clarity on what it was and how it was. And even then, people said they begged to disagree. And that was it. <laughs> there wasn't a consequence. There wasn't a censor. There wasn't any of those things. I just, I just think there's just some interesting conversations around solidarity that needs to be had. And for people that really want to engage in that work without immediate censorship, consider it. Look, I wrote the book on the case for council culture. I know how this works. Wrote the book on it. Understand it very well. All I'm saying is it's been very interesting to watch the shifting of who gets believed automatically, who doesn't have to put forth claims or justify them or provide strong, legitimate proof behind the accusations that they're making that can lead to one's cancellation. Just saying, just saying. So there has been a lot of talk about the new police commissioner. And also, let me just start by saying that Hill Harper is did not take the money, clearly. He's going to still run his race for U.S. Senate. It's going to be interesting, interesting to see where the money's going to go now that he won't take the $20 million to go run against Rashida. He's going to keep his money, and uh, he's going to stay in his race unb unbothered. And so it's interesting to see how his Senate race is going to shake up, because are they going to now make him a target? Is certain people going to support his opponents? Because... They don't want him to do what he's doing. It's been interesting to see. But we're keeping an eye on those races as we get to 2024. So, back to Philly. So, there is a new police commissioner, and it's Commissioner Kevin Bethel. Kevin Bethel will be the next Philadelphia police commissioner. <sighs> Boring. I don't, listen, I see, this is why I came with the police. Look, it wasn't like I was invested, invested, but come on, why? come on. Like, I don't know. There's people that like him. Some of my people tell me they like him. I, he's, um, I just feel like he's super safe. And I don't mean safe as in being a police commissioner makes you safe. I just think it's not a bad choice. What, I mean, what's an ideal choice for a police commissioner? What, what am I talking about? I, look, I don't know. I just feel like, we're just getting the same old, same old. I'm feeling a sense that we're getting the same old, same old. There needs to be some... Look, I am going to... I promised myself this and I promised folks. 
until she is sworn in as mayor of Philadelphia in January of 2024, I am not going to be quick to throw in a towel or making assumptions. There are people right now in her own camp that's close to Sherelle Parker, Mayor-elect Sherelle Parker, that are starting to get a little what's going on here. It's too early, y'all. I don't want to do it. I know how people get on black women in politics. I don't want to be that person. I am just observing the moves and I'm just looking at them. And I think there's people that want to be ready. Some of y'all stay ready to get on an attack. And I don't want to do that. I think it's too fucking early. Let her get in. Let the cabinet get assessed. But all I'm saying is, so far, so dope. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying that these appointments have been horrible. I'm just saying I'm looking at the crowd. I'm looking at the people at the press conferences. And I said this, but it's just giving old guard machine, Democratic machine. And I mean, look, it is what it is. But I'm just saying that if she really wants to really transform Philadelphia or make the real difference. There has to be a shakeup. There has to be some some fun. There has to be some interesting balance. There has to be that. Sources tell me close to the administration is that her biggest thing right now is loyalty. She wants people that's just unapologetically loyal to her. But yeah, but you know, someone should not have to be a God damn super stand to work in the administration. What you need are people that are honest. What you need are people that are respectful. And what you need are people that are competent. That's really what you need in administration. Loyalty can be earned through time. But coming in, giving your devout, ungodly loyalty reminds me of various presidents who came in, bringing people to dinners privately in the White House and saying to them, I need your loyalty, your unbending loyalty. You gotta, it's like, okay, that's a little, that's a little too, too much. Not everybody needs to be at that level. Now, you know, your deputy mayors, perhaps, but it, it, there's gotta be a balance. There's gotta be a balance. Okay. I, I just feel like there's gotta be a balance. Bethel, can he do the job? I guess he can. We talked about him last week. Before he was announced, you all knew Listen to Ernestie speaking. Who was in the four? Who was in the front running for that position? We, I had already laid it down to y'all before the press conference. That's why I tell y'all, listen to Ernestie speaking, and you would never have to worry about, you know, whether or not you're behind or what you're keeping up with. We had already talked about the possibility that it was going to either be Stanford or him or whatnot. And look what happened. Kevin Bethel got it. I knew it. I knew, I had a feeling, I had a feeling that if the option on, she, I feel like her administration is that when you got a menu, right? You can either do the duck or the steak. No, 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 no. Got to put them in the same category. You either doing the duck or you're doing the chicken. They're going to go chicken. When you at the table and it's like, do you want short rib or do you want pot roast? They're going to get the pot roast. They're not going to get the short rib. They're always going to go that direction. If you have a choice between Dorad or Catfish, they're going to go the Catfish direction. They're never going to go in a direction that can allow them to influx, in, in, you know, to accentuate leadership that, that they may not know they have within them. They're just never going to go the, the, that route. They're never going to go for Swordfish. They're going to go with Whiting. <laughs> You know, they're not going to go to Jim's West. They're going to go to Jim's South. Like, they're just never going to go in a direction that's going to require more insight, more depth, more nuance. They're just never going to go that direction. And it's just a little sad to me. It's a little sad. Um, but we don't know. There's more to come. But so far, it's just looking very on script and predictable. And I, I want to shake up. I want to surprise, surprise me. 
Get me some people under 40. Bring some millennials. Bring some bring some energy. Bring some folks. You know, everybody can't be listen. The biggest what I heard from sources, the complaint about Stanford was that they say he was young. Stanford is 44 years old, y'all. He's been in the force for over 20 years. If Stanford is too young for that job, listen, I don't know. I, I just don't know what direction. If 44, hell, Cheryl's 50. They're not that far from each other. If, like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, everybody moves the goalposts. People just move the goalposts too much. It, it does this gotta be different. You cannot do this city. The, the most important voting block right now are millennials in Philadelphia. You cannot ignore them. You cannot ignore them. If everybody in the administration gonna be in the 60s, then what the fuck? You know, I just <laughs> I just think like we saw a woman die. We saw a woman who been worked her entire career in multiple positions die on stage. The late, great Joanne Epps literally died on stage. And I'm not saying that, you know, older people cannot, you know, senior, you know, people that are, are seasonal professionals. But at some point, you got to recognize that these are stressful jobs and that stress take a toll on your health and your well-being. And if we're putting the most stressful jobs on the shoulders of those who are past the age of senior citizen, that means something. That means something. I'm not saying that everybody got to retire and go to whatever, but, but why are people like, we got to keep it 100. We got to keep it 100. We have to keep it. Joanne Epps was 72 years old. 72 years old. And they was used, I mean, and Biden is 71 years old. Like, we got to look, we got, like, we have to think about, these are stressful jobs. Like, she was serving as executive vice president and provost of Temple University. She played as an interim of the 13th president. She was the first black woman to be permanently appointed and serve as president of the university. She had a lot of stress. There was a lot of things going on at, at Temple that put a lot of stress. And we just have to be realistic about that and stop acting like everybody. We got to stop acting like everybody can do X, Y, and Z things. Sometimes you don't, you, you know, at that point, like, let me say, let me be real about me. When I get past the age of 65, Mr. Owens will be somewhere in a lovely, nice, you know, beach house somewhere in, in the vineyard or going to probably have a nice couple of offices and, and, and stuff out in the country. I am going to be an, a, an advisor, but I am not going to be the boss of everything past these five. At that point, I'm going to be advising people. I'm going to be funneling money and supporting important candidates. I'm going to be you know, getting residuals off of things. I'm going to write books and love letters. That's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to host parties and I'm going to be fabulous, but I'm not going to be trying to prove something to people and, and keep running things. I'm I'm going to look, I'm going to let the, I'm going to let the other people have it. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to let the next generation have it. At that point, it'll be generation ZYX or something. And I will let them have some, some leeway in things. That's what I want to do. I have no intention on being in the boss boss forever, ever, and ever. I believe that everybody should be passing down the throne and passing down the crown and, and, and creating space. And that doesn't mean you go away. It just means that you occupy things differently. My, 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 my late grandmother taught me so much about this. And the way that she described it was, and I still believe in this, is that at a certain point in your life, it's like flowers. You you get the flowering, you get the watering. And then eventually you get to the point where you become less of the plant and more of the gardener. So right now I'm at this age where people are watering me and, 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 and nourishing me and giving me seeds to grow and grow. 
But at a certain point, I need to become the person that does the watering and does the seeding and the growing. Like you got to reverse it. Okay. You have to, that's the way the circle of life works. You go from being the one to receive to becoming the giver to those in need. And so in many parts of my life already, I find myself being the giver. Like, like, look, I'm the oldest brother. So now I'm in a position where big brother got to help little brother, little brothers. You know, they got to, you know, I, I got to, you know, make sure I help my little brother. Now, did I have a big brother to help me? No, but I I was the only, I was the firstborn. So my mom gave me the undivided attention at that point and, and whatnot. That's how it is. That's how it works. You know, if you work in a career, you start off as an intern. So you need the support, the mentorship for someone to guide you through. But then eventually, once you get out of mentee, you have to become a mentor. You have to bring up the next generation. So in this industry, I've been in this industry for over 10 years. When I came in the door, I had mentors that supported me, gave me connections, recommended me, spoke my name in rooms where I wasn't, I had no access. Now I've transitioned to a place where I'm doing that for younger people coming in, younger writers and people in the industry trying to get in the door. I write letters of recommendations. I'm thinking of them for opportunities and scholarships. I'm giving them shout outs. That's how you're supposed to do it. It's supposed to be a circle. And then eventually they will do the same. We don't talk about succession enough in the black community. We don't talk about succession plans enough in black leadership. We don't have a conversation about how do we keep this going in a way that's sustainable, progressive, and impactful. What we do is we wait for people to literally die before we make room. That's got to get tired. People either got to die, have a diagnosis, a health scare, or, or have to fall out on luck or get fucking indicted. Like, we just have to wait for that to happen before we finally open the door. There has to be a beautiful and peaceful transition. And there has been some good examples of that. Like, I'm not saying it has not happened in politics. But when you look at, like, like Miriam Tasco has done it. You know, she, the queen, political queen. They call her the drop queen, but she is the queen of, of Philadelphia politics, Right. Miriam Tasco laid a foundation and she literally passed that torch. I think of um, Blondell Reynolds Brown. Like she, you know, had that seat at large and she mentored Kathy Gilmer Richardson to the point where now Kathy Gilmer Richardson is now in the position. Now Kathy has it in her where eventually she needs to start. I mean, she's still fairly young in this role, but eventually she's going to have to mentor and bring in someone, right? That's how it works. That's how it works. And so there has been some successful succession plans in politics. But then there has been some that's just been plain old sloppy. You know, when you look at what happened with Fatah and Dwight Evans and all that, like that was just sloppy. Sloppy. You look at what happened with the sheriff's office. How many goddamn sheriffs keep coming in? And there's no healthy pipeline. That, that role is cursed. It's cursed. It's cursed. It's been trash since green. The, the, I don't even know why we have a sheriff's office at this point. And speaking of sheriff's office, they got a new, listen, I don't know what they're doing with that sheriff's money, but now they got a mascot or something like that that they're trying to do to encourage kids. I don't know what's going on over there. I saw the video. Yes, I saw the video. Y'all could not make me not see the video. And I looked at that video. And I said, what are we doing? What is this? This is what the taxpayer's dollars are going to? A, a damn mascot that is supposed to encourage people? I, I, I guess. I guess. How about you just make sure people get their homes? How about that? Make sure people actually get access to their homes. We'll, we'll, we'll focus on that. So, yeah, I just, I don't know. I just, I just hope that this administration is just a lot more diverse. And I'm not talking diverse on race. I think Sherelle's going to definitely have some black people in these positions. But I would like to see some age diversity. I would like to see some, some political diversity. There just needs to be a lot more in there representation-wise. Because we didn't, we, we didn't, we, we don't want four more years in, of Kenny, but we also don't want four more years of ignored pol political power. Philadelphia just needs to look and feel different. And I just hope people don't lose sight of that. So. I heard that Derek Chauvin, the man who um, was responsible for murdering George Floyd, got stabbed in prison. And then we're going to move on. 
So Tiffany Haddish had a DUI um, recently that got news. And, you know, for whatever reason, it just struck me about this particular DUI. But just the fact that celebrities, you know, I I take DUI seriously. Drinking under the influence is, is not cool. It's not what's up. I wish people would stop fucking doing it. I, long story short, in high school, there was a, uh, there was well, actually in middle school, there was a boy I was really good friends with in middle school. Um, and then we went to high school and <sighs> during a prom night, he, he got hit by a drunk driver. He was the sweetest, most kindest guy, very positive, very, his name was Chuck. Um, nicest guy ever. And he died because of a drunk driver. Like he was driving late at night from prom. And that, and I remember that changed my entire prom. Like it was like my prom night. I didn't even go out late. I was so scared because there's so much driving in Texas and we got highways and everything, but I just, you know, DUI. And then the person who did it, you know, was alive. I, I, I have no fucking pity for fucking people who do DUIs, who get stopped for DUIs. It's disgusting. It's reckless. People have died. People, innocent lives, sons, mothers, daughters. It is despicable. And so the fact that Tiffany Haddish has already been doing dumb shit and weird shit for quite some time. And quite frankly, I don't know why she still gets a career. But this DUI, fuck you. Fuck you. I, I really don't have... I Honestly, I thought I never had... I just want people that if you if you recognize, if you've done a DUI, right? Don't ever do it again. And if you didn't hurt somebody, thank God. But I, I need people who... who I need people to just seriously stop. If you've had a drinking problem, get help. That's it. If you if you in a D, if you ever in a DUI situation, I'm telling people right now, you need rehab immediately. You need you need to get help immediately. I know people who've had made mistakes in the past. I, I'm not and I'm not saying that anybody who had problems in their past, there's nothing there. But I'm saying that when that happens, there you you need to get help. Like, you have to stop drinking. You need to work on recovery. Like, there's no excuses. If you ever have had a DUI incident, now I'm not saying if you kill somebody now, you didn't even hit nobody. But if you get stopped, that's the point for me where you are drinking at a level where you don't have any control. And when you don't have control, then that means that you need to get help. Because if you feel like you can literally drive while under the influence, that to me is a red flag. You need to change your lifestyle immediately because you can't keep doing that. You can't do it again because someone's life is on the line. So if you have had a situation, a DUI in the past, in my world, I'm not saying that you're a terrible person. I'm saying that you are a terrible person if you don't seek help after that. And so I just feel like with Tiffany Haddish, they said that she kept doing her comedy shows, but this time people was picking up and driving her. I'm sorry. You need to stop drinking, period. You need to stop drinking because it shouldn't take all of that to do what it do. And people get so mad. No, you literally are behind the wheel. You could have hurt somebody. And there are people who've died. Like I know folks who've lost loved ones because of that. Stop it. Seriously. It like that experience in my high school years made me change the way I move. Like New Year's, I'm not driving. I'm not going out New Year's. I, I do something at my house, but all that hitting the club, going from club, I don't even do it anymore. Like, I, I, I rarely do it at this point. Like, everything is at my house. Everybody is, you know, we, we are under one roof. If people leave, they leave, you know, they're nearby. You know, we we, we take in group Ubers. We, 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 we're we in, a, in a proximity near each other. But it's 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 a reasonable, you know, because we don't we don't want people to be, you know, it's just... It's just too much out there. So, yeah, I just wanted to just say that. That just was that was heavy on my heart. Um, so this Deanna Taylor, Iman Shumper situation, I've been following it, the divorce. You know, she kind of, you know, there's been a lot of celebrity divorces this year. But interesting enough, the way that, you know, um, 
Tiana Taylor described it to us a couple of months ago was like, oh, there was no cheating. They just, you know, had irreconcilable differences, but they co-parented for their kids, everything cool. But court documents have revealed recently that, that she secretly filed for divorce in January. She said he was a narcissist. Basically, she outlined how, you know, she had to basically dim her light in her career in order to appease his. Um, she felt very insecure. There was a lot of emotional distress, a lot of verbal abuse, a lot of things. Not, not. I don't think there was anything in there that said physical abuse, but there was just a lot of insecurity and a lot of um, stress that she had in that marriage. And, you know, I... I, I You got to marry, you got to marry, you got to marry, you got to marry your equal. It's wild because they didn't have shows and they didn't talk about, you know, they, they they did all the the public stuff. But I always tell people, you got to know who you're marrying. You got to know who you're marrying. You can't just marry somebody based on being they cute, you cute, so we go together. Or y'all just have great sex. You got to have all of it. You got to have the three Ds, as I say, dick, dollars, and dominance. But no, you got to have... <laughs> Oh my goodness. No, you got to have, you just got to make sure you're with a person that is, is a holistic person. I, I just, I've, I've, I, I see people who get engaged and get married and some of these people just be like, oh, you know, this person put up with me, so I'm with them. It's like, it can't just be somebody putting up with you because this guy will be someone that's not going to just put up with you, but put on you, put you on. Are you putting up with me? Or are you putting on me? Are you putting me on? Or are you just putting up? And I feel like a person that puts me on rather than puts up is, is the goal. Putting up with somebody is, a friend can do that. But somebody's going to put you on, meaning are they going to elevate you? Are they going to encourage you? Are they going to inspire you? Are they going to you know support you in those ways? And can you do the same for them, right? Are you in a position where you all can be able to support each other when when one is disproportionate, you know, um, and something, not everything clearly, but like you want to be with somebody that, that compliments you and understands you and like you as you are, you know, that's important. Somebody that really likes you as you are, that you don't feel like you got to change it up or switch it up. A lot of people do that for love. I'm very happy that I'm with somebody who knows how eccentric I am, how opinionated I am, how spoken I am, and they 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 down with it. They rock with it. And they're not even just like me. They're we're really different when it comes to how we approach things, but that doesn't mean that because we're different in that approach that we're distant. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Let's be clear. We may not tackle things the same way, but we understand them the same way. And I think that's the thing about have an equally, equally yoked relationship. We have similar political views. We have a common understanding about the world and the way it should be. And we are able to be, um, you know, what, what is the word they say in relationships? Um, compatible because of that. I think people expect people to be exactly like them. I don't want, I, I realized very quickly in my life, I didn't want to date another person that was just like me. And what I mean by that is not think the way I think, but had the same approach as me to things. Because I feel like that wasn't going to challenge me. That wasn't going to actually, you know, level me in a way to make me, to inform me. I love dating a man that is very mild-mannered. Now, let's be clear. Mild-mannered doesn't mean passive. It means that he's just somebody who is going to consider various things and he's going to respond differently in those ways because of how just his style, right? Everybody's style is different, but the difference cannot be distant, meaning that just because I do it my way doesn't mean that we are separate on each other and supporting each other. We do. The things I do and say, let's be clear, Mr. Johnson agrees with 99% of it. He's not going to go out and say the same thing I said the same way, but let's let's be very clear. He endorses these ideas, and so it's funny because people be thinking that 
and <laughs> anybody who's close to us and, and going out and hang out with us, they'll know. But I think there's people that be out there thinking, oh, you know, Ernest is just this eccentrically loud person. Blah, 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 blah. And I know so-and-so must be tired of him saying this and saying this. Actually, he's not. Actually, he he tells me to go harder sometimes. Um, just saying. But but that being said, um, that's why when people talk about Beyonce and Jay-Z, they be like, oh, Beyonce must be annoyed with Jay-Z. No, she not. She's a black capitalist like him. I know y'all that breaks y'all hope, that breaks y'all soul that that she that she shares some of them problematic thoughts that he has. But listen, you don't marry somebody unless you were in the same wave. And if you and if you're not, that's when divorce typically happens. But it looked like they've been together for over 10 something plus years. So it don't look like that's happening for them. Okay. So that should tell you a couple of things. But y'all be having these parasocial relations with celebrities that just y'all feel like y'all know them. And it's like, do y'all really let me be quiet. I'm not going down that rabbit hole. But what I will say is that if you actually listen to some of the stuff these celebrities say, and y'all actually listen to what their husbands and their spouses say, and you see how they stick beside them, understand that they're sharing those ideals. And maybe they don't want to speak to them because they already know how y'all react. But understand that they, that none of that stuff that they do collectively or separately is as separate as you think it is. Because I'm letting y'all know that's not how it is in my marriage. Trust me. If I feel a certain way about a certain situation, they share the same thoughts too. They just do. They just do. Okay? Don't think for five seconds Bill and Hillary Clinton are just somewhere on equal. Even Michelle and Barack. Look, Michelle is a perfect example. She do things a little differently. But understand that when you really go toe-to-toe, pound-for-pound, they share the same ideas and thoughts about the world. They just express their thoughts differently. Just saying. Okay? So, <laughs> um, but so anyway, I, I, you know, with, with the two of them separated, we didn't know this because of the fact that initially um, Tiana Taylor only used initials in her court filings and her, in her information because she really did not want the public to know. But recently, the husband, the ex-husband, um, the, the ex-NBA player, Shumpert, Shumpert has decided to go public and he uses his real name on the documents, which then drew the public's attention, the media and everybody to know it's them. Now, look, I like Tiana Taylor, but her statement was a little like, she's telling everybody, mind their business, this, that, and the third. But baby, first of all, anything that's public record is public record. No one leaked anything. She said something about leaking things, public documents. How do you leak public documents? If it's public documents, that means it's accessible, which means it wasn't leaked. Like, I don't know who's on her team, but I was a little annoyed with that. But I feel for her. She's going through some things and clearly I have sympathy for her. But I was just kind of like, girl, don't blame the media. I know you're still trying to keep it cute with him. But okay, he's the father of your child. But sometimes people I feel like use that he's our father, our kid. Listen, leave them kids out of it. Some, listen, the kids are going to be fine. The children are right. The kids are right. I just sometimes feel like people use that as an example as a, as a to justify whatever. If you want your privacy, you want your privacy. But at the end of the day, keep it 100 he didn't have to put his full name on those documents, which didn't allow and alert the public to them. So your, your, your ex-husband is actually the reason why the public knew about it, because he decided to not allow the initial situation to keep going through. So it's actually his fault, and you don't want to blame him, but don't blame the media, don't blame the public, okay? Just, just saying, just saying. So we have seen an increase on, um, you know, there, people have been asking this about why there's been so many celebrities that have been accused of sexual assault at the same time. A lot of things happened before Thanksgiving. A lot went down, okay? A flurry of accusations. We talked about this. Um, the lawsuits were in New York City, right? New York City is having a huge Me Too moment. The lawsuits are all been filed under New York's Adult Survivors Act, the ASA, which has now expired. It officially expired. Um, and so let me give you all some background about this. Um, the law was brought a year in a, it was, this law came in a year ago and created a year long suspension of the usual time limit that people could sue over the alleged sexual assault before that. Okay. New York laws meant that most adult survivors of sexual abuse have between one to five years to bring a civil lawsuit or press criminal charges. Right. 
But during the look back period, survivors could sue over abuse that happened at any point in their adult life. Okay, and this is according to Sky um, News, who did this this breakdown. But they were just saying that during the lock look back period, survivors could sue over abuse that happened at any point in their adult life. But now the window will expire at the end of which it, 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 it ended officially on Thursday. That was Thanksgiving. Um, and that window had opened on the 24th of November, 2022. So basically this was modeled on a previous New York law that basically gave people abused as children, a temporary window to file claims. Um, but by the time the child, the child victims acts two year window closed, um, in August of 2021, 11,000 people filed lawsuits and that many of them involved the Roman Catholic church. So there's been more than 2,500 lawsuits that's been filed under ASA. And so the big ones have involved A. Axel Rose, who was accused by this a woman, a former penthouse magazine model named Sheila Kennedy, of sexually assaulting her in a New York City hotel room in 1989. Jamie Foxx also faced, um, was sued under it last week. And this is a woman who accused the Hollywood star of sexual assaulting her at a New York rooftop lounge in 2015. Um, other people, this American writer and filmmaker named A.M. Lucas accused White Lines actor Nuno uh, Lopez, Nuno Lopez, of drugging and raping her in 2006. And then on Tuesday, a woman accused Bill Cosby of drugging and sexually abusing her after offering to mentor her in her acting career, which is now more than 60 women who have accused him now of rape, sexual assault, and sexual harassment. The photographer Terry Richardson, which has been known and has been accused in the past of inappropriate behavior, but he there's a new lawsuit that was filed against him on Tuesday against a Spanish model, um, Mervina, um, or Minervira, um, Minerva, uh, Portillo. That's the name I'm messing up. But then you got people in the music industry like uh, Jimmy Lovine, who was sued by a woman who claimed that she was sexually abused, forcibly touched, and subject to sexual harassment in 2017. And then, of course, there's more people. My goodness. Cuba Gooding Jr., who already had a situation. He pleaded guilty in 2002, in 2002 of April for no jail time. But, but basically, Cuba Gooding Jr. was sued again by two women who sexual assault allegations against him was formed on the basis of a process of, of, of basis of a criminal prosecution that ended with him pleading guilty, but he served no jail time. One of the first lawsuits filed when the look back period was open was against Donald Trump. Now this happened with that writer E. Jean Carroll in 1986. Um, Trump denied the allegation. Jamie Foxx has denied these allegations and these other men who've been accused have said the same thing. However, others that have been sued Previously was Russell Brand, um, of course, Harvey Weinstein, Sean Pity Combs, who got two other additional um, lawsuits filed against him after selling with Cass again with Cassie, you know, two weeks ago or a week or so ago. Um, this situation now has happened where you got there's a case from him in 1991. They're saying him and his R and B artist, Aaron Hall. Apparently, sexually assaulted a woman in 91. I was born in 91, so this shit was like 32 years old, years ago. Apparently, they had drugged, sexually abused her, and filmed it, apparently. And so she's filed this suit. And so all of this has happened. Um, it's a lot of things going on. And even, even, even more baffling is that, and I almost like forgot about this person, but the other part that people are not talking about is which has caused a lot of spark. Um, mm, 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 mm. Um, this one right here is, is the one. Eric Adams. Eric Adams has been accused as well. Something back in 93, um, he was accused um, of a 1993 sexual assault. Breaking news now into CNN. New York Mayor Eric Adams is being accused of sexual assault. The alleged assault happened back in 1993, and that's according to court documents. Yeah. 
documents filed yesterday. So let's get right into it with CNN's Gene Cazares. Gene, what are you learning? This is breaking right now. It, well, this is under the Adult Survivors Act, which is expiring at the end of this week. And this allows alleged victims to come forward no matter when they believe this sexual assault happened. It's all about sexual assault, sexual battery. And so this is a summons at this point that was filed, and it's from 30 years ago. According to the alleged victim, it was 1993. They both were city employees, it is alleged, and in this summons it says that she is accusing the now mayor of sexual assault, sexual battery, employment discrimination, retaliation, hostile work environment, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. Now, suing him, the mayor, of course, along with the city of New York, the police department, so many other defendants citywide, and asking for a minimum of $5 million. Now, we do have a response. Minutes ago, the mayor of New York City gave a response to this legal filing that just happened. Listen to this. You know, it's, it's, um, it's uh, absolutely not true. Uh, you know, I would, I, would, I would never do anything to harm uh, anyone. And uh, just really uh, say, you know, my career speaks for itself. And uh, just really uh, something absolutely that, that has never happened. And I, I don't even recall ever um, uh, meeting a person who made uh, the, uh, this uh, allegation. Uh, but, you know, I have a city to run and I'm focused and I have to make sure that we continue to, to, to do so. But uh, absolutely, uh, this has never happened. Thank you. So at this point, the summons has been filed. Now it will be on to the complaint. There is a time period where they that can file that complaint. And then, of course, the city of New York and the mayor himself can file legal answers to all of that. So uh, this uh, is no joke. I was I said, let me let me use some audio to describe what's going on, because I, I just felt like I mean, I wasn't going to. We're going to follow these cases. The cases are casing. I mean, the the, the expiration date was um, Thanksgiving. These men definitely had a, must have had a very difficult Thanksgiving of discomfort. Um, it's it's no joke. You know, women are speaking out. People are speaking. I'm, I'm curious to see what happens. I, I really am going to follow these cases. These are no jokes. How many people are going to settle? How many people are going to fight it? And please note that these are civil suits, so only settlements can happen. Um, there is no criminal, um, you know, you can't go to jail or anything of that nature. Criminal, The criminal aspect of a lot of these incidents have passed a certain breach. So now only that can happen are lawsuits and civil suits. And now at this point, you can't sue beyond that. So you can't sue a person and say, this person did this to me. There can't be some type of punitive legal stuff. It can be an accusation at this point, but you can't do anything um, to, you know, there's a window. So it's a lot. It's a lot. We, we've, we've seen a lot happen. Now, to Ask Ernest, um, this is Ask Ernest. I had like about a couple of variations of this question in some way. Either it was a question or it was a phrase or a statement to me. And I'm going to read one of them. So they said, hey, Ernest, I hope that you're enjoying your holiday break and getting the well-needed rest that you deserve. Thank you. I want to know your thoughts about Thanksgiving. You know, I have recently done a lot of research and reading on how Thanksgiving is a very problematic holiday that's really supporting the genocide of in the indigenous communities. And I'm surprised that you're like celebrating Thanksgiving and having a good time. I see you got pictures of the food, but like, how do you feel celebrating Thanksgiving as somebody who oftentimes speak out against a uh, mass atrocities to marginalized people? I know that it's not involving black people, but indigenous people have been exploited throughout the beginning of history. And you yourself have spoken about it in your book. So how do you celebrate Thanksgiving even though it's about genocide. Okay. And I come in a place of love because I think this person, this person I know asked this question and, they, and they're coming from a very sincere place. 
But this is why cultural competency matters. The person who asked me this question is not black. So a lot of black people that's listening to this is going to know where I'm about to go with it. And I'm going to go there. Let me explain some to you all. Folks that are not black. Just, just let y'all know some things. Black people don't celebrate Thanksgiving because of the fucking pilgrims. Okay. We don't even talk about Sacagawea. We do not. Which Sacagawea is indigenous and was a good person. We're not, I'm just saying, we're not having conversations about Sacagawea. We're not talking about Captain John Smith. We're not talking about any of the things that I guess colonizers and other folks are doing for Thanksgiving. We don't have any, um, you know, cornucopias and all that. We, we don't do that. We, we don't. Like, it, it don't mean that for us. It, it never has. I've never, ever had a Thanksgiving dinner with black people my family, and not one time did we ever talk about the Native Americans, the indigenous people, and pilgrims, and Plymouth Rock. We just never have those conversations. It was never why we gathered. I don't know what white people do at Thanksgiving. I don't know why they, I don't know how they do it. But let me explain something to you all. We got to understand cultural experiences. We have never tried to adjust or adapt our food. That's part of why we don't even eat fucking pumpkin, to be honest. Because that none of that that food or what they did and how they... We, we never get into the history of the original. We are not about that life. Never have been. Thanksgiving means something very different for black people. The foods that we cook when we use is different. It's a time for black people to come together in family and reflect on life. It's a time of reflection. It's a, retire, it's a time of gathering. It is a safe space. It's supposed to be a safe space for black family and folk and friends and whoever to gather and reflect and rejoice. We eat soul food. We eat food that oftentimes came from slavery. And we use this as an opportunity to gather ourselves, reflect, to come together. That's what it's about for us. It ain't got nothing to do about... All that other stuff. We we don't really... We, you If you ask them with the Mayflower Compact, they wouldn't even know what to tell you. It, it's just not that vibe. It's not that vibe. We don't put any pictures or decorations up. We don't have none of the, 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 the art illustrations we see in schools where they show all these in, Indians. and We don't do any of that. We don't do any of that. That's just not how we celebrate Thanksgiving. It's just not. There's, there's none of that over here. And because that's not what it means for us. And historically... The history of our gathering came from the fact that we eat things that celebrate the black ingenuity of a civilization of people who have been also attempted to be erased and, and experienced attempts of genocide throughout its, its lineage. The African diaspora, right? Baked mac and cheese was invented by a black person. The greens that we eat, the way we eat our greens, the recipes that we cook come from the times in which we were enslaved, Okay. It is about gathering our people in that time of reflection and, and spiritualness. It is a very different vibe. As you saw from what I said earlier, the reason why we eat the things we eat and how we eat them ain't got nothing to do with genocide or any of those things. We're not saying, oh, yo, let's get a glass of red wine and give a cheers to the pilgrims. Fuck no. If you think, first of all, because I got to give y'all a little bit of American history. First of all, how is it that you, where, where do you think black people were when all that was going on over there in, 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 in Cape May and, you know, Cape Cod or whatever the fuck she's called? Where do you think that was happening? With, where do you think black people were when all of that stuff was going on? When it was, you know, when there was people getting scalped and all of that stuff was going on by the Mayflower and these, where do you think, where were black people in, in that time? If you know the answer to that question, then, 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 then tell me what would we be celebrating? Because while there were indigenous people that was experiencing all types of atrocities, there were also indigenous people during that time that were also partaking in the enslavement of black people. Go look it up. Go look it up. Enslaved black people were also enslaved by some of the same marginalized people that we 
are in solidarity with, let's be clear, but we acknowledge that that anti-blackness anywhere was anti-blackness everywhere. And so we need to be very clear that as much as we see today that there's these solidarities and this, uni and this unison we talk about, we got to look at the history. They were enslaving us too. That enslavement for black people did not stop just with the pilgrims. It crossed over the Mayflower just like it did its other. It crossed over into other groups too. Just want to say, put that on the table. No pun intended. Just want to put it on the table. But to be clear, that's not why we celebrate Thanksgiving either. It was never about any of these ideals. We just get together, have fun, have family, have food, and that's it. And I ain't explaining the goddamn thing. Sometimes you just got to tell people, sometimes we need to do a little bit more research before we start trying to create or cancel things. Listen, I wrote the book on cancel culture. I get why personally indigenous people may say, you know what, I'm not celebrating Thanksgiving. But understand that black people that celebrate Thanksgiving, we don't celebrate it for those reasons. And to be quite honest, you could call it something else. We don't even got to call it Thanksgiving. But some of y'all just take some stuff and y'all take the liberty and you're not doing your research. I'm all for not celebrating certain things. Listen, I don't celebrate the 4th of July. I really don't. I mean, I do. I celebrate the 4th of Jamarcus. So when you say, well, you be partying on 4th of July. I party on the 4th of Jamarcus. My best friend's birthday is on July 4th. We turn that into a day to celebrate him. We ain't celebrating America. We wasn't free then. Juneteenth is my 4th of July. But, you know, listen, if people want to celebrate that, on, if they want another day to take work, take work off, it's just never been that deep for us, to be honest. That's just, to be honest. This is a lot of people that be just, you, you, context fucking matters. Context matters. Context matters. If you lack context, points cannot be fucking made. You can't make a point if you lack context. If you can't conceptualize Anything to which you're critiquing or saying, you don't need to be in this. And I think that's the problem with some of the writers out here. I'm seeing a lot of these, I don't like to call them think pieces because I write those and people take that out of words. But I see a lot of people want to write these opinions or have these hot takes. And I'm cool with people having them because Lord knows I have them. But you have to have them with context. And if you don't have context, you miss the point. Biggest example of context for me is when people often talk about Oh, this person back in 1992 made a homophobic joke and, you know, they were terrible. And I don't like them because they had a homophobic joke. Let me explain something to y'all. You know, homophobia is problematic, right? But comedians who made gay jokes in the early 90s that have evolved and moved past that shit now, I give them grace. Because you got to think about where pop culture was and how people normalize that and how literally there were laws and, and, and consequences for people who almost did not partake in homophobia. Like the reason why I love Denzel Washington, right, is that Denzel Washington was in the movie Philadelphia with Tom Hanks, who was also a cishet man. They both cishet men. They played a film and, and Tom Hanks played a man that was gay with HIV. And, 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 and they told Denzel that that would have been career suicide for him to be in a film showing love and support and empathy to somebody who experienced that. Denzel was incredible in Philadelphia and he should have gotten another Oscar nomination for his performance. But that's another story for another day. Um, he was too busy in another great film called Malcolm X, right? So I say all this to say that he was getting ready for that film actually because he lost to Al Pacino in The Sin of a Woman, which... That's another conversation for another day. Al Pacino should have never won that Oscar for that, but we'll talk about that another time. Anywho, Denzel made that risk and people thought that was risky. They thought that would be career suicide. So you gotta understand, that movie came out around 92. The fact that this man, this, this, this black man who was a Hollywood star, had already won an Oscar already, Best Supporting Actor for Glory, right? This man won an Academy Award. He's an Academy Award winning black actor. And they're telling him that because he's in a film that is about a gay character, that to be in to, to, to be in that film would commit to suicide. You gotta understand what that means for where we were in that world. 
that in that world, anything that amplified or supported queer people was considered toxic or problematic. Madonna, people can say what they want about Madonna, but Madonna leaned into it in a way where her platforms, that, that was considered controversial. And so if you're applying a 2023 mindset on some shit that happened in 1991, 1992, you don't fucking get it. And I think we we don't acknowledge that. Now, I'm not saying that certain viewpoints. Now, racism is different because the N-word was bad in 91, like the N-word was bad in 90, 95, like it was bad in 2002, like it was bad in 18, 1985 to 70. The N-word has always been a bad word. So anybody who's out here outwardly racist and, and doing like extreme racist shit, if you was a segregationist, nah, baby, there, there's no grace for you. But when it comes to, and even rape, right? Rape is rape. If you rape somebody in 95 and you rape somebody in 96, rape was always a fucking problem, right? So that to me, like that's the difference. But when we're talking about ideals, political ideals, like, like for example, Obama did not support gay marriage when he first ran. He supported civil unions. Nobody... Most elected officials did not support gay marriage because they thought that it was political suicide. So they could never say gay marriage outright and out front because if you wasn't in Massachusetts or Vermont, most, most everywhere else didn't support it. But look what happened when Obama got the information. He was the president that turned the White House rainbow when marriage equality happened in, in, in 2015. So I give people grace and space, Right. I give people grace and space on how they believe in policing. There was a lot of people back in the 90s, a lot of our black civil rights leaders and folks, that was all about, you know, hey, we need three strikes. We need to clean up the streets, the police, the police, the police. Now a lot of those people looking back and saying, damn, we didn't know that was going to fuel mass incarceration. We didn't know what we didn't know. You got to acknowledge that. Now, there is some accountability, right? But we got to acknowledge that context was very different in the world we lived in. So I just never, you know, look, I don't come from this in the sense that every single person that did something from yesterday to yonder year should be crucified. If they're showing that they're growing, if they're showing evolution, like people like Kevin Hart, he's stuck on stupid. He's been a dickhead. He's been homophobic. He doesn't apologize for it. Fuck him. Like, yeah, I don't fuck with Kevin Hart. But you got other people out in the world that definitely has evolved since those days. And so I just think we have to acknowledge that aspect of change. I mean, Eddie Murphy definitely evolved from where he used to be when he used to do the show Raw. His standard routine was highly homophobic. But that was the time that we were in. That's how society view people. You look at the ableism. Like, society is still not coming to full terms with ableism. Like, people don't understand the words of vernacular not to use. You, If you think gay issues are a problem, think about how trans people were treated. Like the, the like we're finally at a point in society where we're we're getting better at pronouns and, and and really calling people out for misgendering or pushing out negative stereotypes about trans people. But we gotta put all of that in context. And I think too often we're not doing that, and that is why we end up in the predicaments that we're in. So Thanksgiving, black people celebrate differently. What you think we're celebrating is not what we're doing, and it's unfortunate that you have not been. You need to go out, talk to people, ask black people. You asked me, I'm black. I gave you an answer. So I guess hopefully you recognize that the way that other people might be reflecting on Thanksgiving is not the way that we do, period. So movies, 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 movies. I haven't really watched any movies. I mean, there's Napoleon that just came out. It it, it did really well at the box office. Um, this is the new Riley Scott film because apparently there's going to be a Gladiator 2 coming out very soon. Who asked for that? Gladiator is about to turn 25 years old. I remember it. Russell Crowe won Best Actor and won Best Picture. Um, it's interesting because Riley Scott loved him some Joaquin Phoenix. Joaquin Phoenix was nominated for Best Supporting Actor for his role in that film. Now he's in this new film called Napoleon and it's good. It's very good. It's Napoleon is that was fun. I don't know how it's going to do an Oscar conversation, but a good box office success doesn't hurt it none. Um, you know, I'm just waiting for the color purple to come out in the theater so the rest of the world can see and be as wild and impressed. Um, other films I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to Maestro are um, coming out soon. 
That's that that big film with uh, Bradley Cooper uh, that's coming. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, Renaissance had its premiere um, over the weekend. Everybody was there. Um, all the big stars. She invited all the girls of Destiny's Child. Can y'all stop asking for Farrah? I don't know why y'all keep asking for Farrah. Farrah Franklin does not fuck with Destiny's Child. Y'all keep saying, where's Farrah? Where's Farrah? Farrah is the one that will not rock with the rest of them. But you see, you know, um, Latavia is around, you know, Latoya, um, of course, Kelly and Michelle. The rest of the girls are showing up. So I don't know why y'all keep asking for 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 Farrah. Farrah's not coming. Farrah is not coming. She still continues to be, you know, upset about how everything went down, even though that's been nearly 25 years ago. But the girls are still girling and the girls are still beefing, so it is what it is. Everybody else seems to be, you know, down, right? Time has passed, people's had careers, people out here trying to live their best life. Um, it's just it's 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 interesting. Um, Jules then got an older. He was there at the premiere, Lizzo was there. Um, Laverne Cox was there. Uh, Matt T.S. Madison was there. It was a star set of premiere. Um, Beyonce did not enter the silver red carpet, whatever the, the, the sparkle was, but she did show up and she came out with this platinum blonde hairstyle. But I also noticed something else. Have y'all seen these pictures? The, the only, the, the hair may have gotten lighter, but the skin complexion definitely was light. It was light. I'm sorry. I am, I've seen Beyonce over the years. That her skin complexion is definitely was super pale. I don't know why. I just noticed it. Maybe it was the editing of the photo, but I don't know why she was super light. She looked like a white woman. She looked like Kim Kardashian. And I, I mean, listen, I love Beyonce like the next stand, but a thing's a thing. I don't know what was going on with them pictures, but her skin complexion just, it was a super light. And she's always been light skinned. But like, even when I look at her video, she just did to promote the trailer, right? So let me tell you how I find these pictures. I don't know if y'all saw them. But if you look at her on the Renaissance tour, if you look at her, she just did a video um, that she did promoting um, the final trailer before the film comes out, which comes out this upcoming Friday on World AIDS Day, which is a big deal and because her, her uncle, Uncle Johnny, passed away from HIV AIDS complications many, many decades ago. I believe in the early 90s. But she dedicated the Renaissance album and tour to him. And so that is it's interesting and intentional that she dropped it then. But that being said, I look at this recent video that she did announcing the trailer on Thanksgiving and she's got this beautiful bronze complexion and that's her complexion. Now, when I went on Yv Yvette No Shows, um, which is her agent, um, I looked at that, um, I looked at that, um, those photos and I said, um, what's going on here? Cause that skin complexion, that ain't her. That's not her. And a lot of people was talking about, like, I'm like, that's not her. That skin complexion is not her. I mean, the dress is pretty. Beyonce looks good. But her skin color is just too light. And it's weird. It's very weird. She looks like a white woman in this photo. Um, yeah. Um, there are people that have been critical. They're saying that they don't want her to put the film in Israel. A lot of people are commenting on their post saying that she shouldn't push the film in Israel right now with everything that's going on. They want her to take a political stance. But I tell people all the time that, you know, um, it's a lot. So apparently, according to the New York Times, in the upcoming film, Beyonce reveals that Blue Ivy saw online criticism by her tour performance. And instead of quitting, she decided to train harder for future stops. <sighs> the girl is 12. Why are people putting this pressure on this, this young lady? Um... There's a lot going on. There's a lot. I, I First of all, she saw the online crit criticism of her performances. We talked about this and she decided to go harder. I guess. I don't know. I don't feel like she needs to care. Like she's a young, she's young. 
But I mean, I'm happy that she's having a good time. People saying people are saying that she must have been challenging her inner Donatella with this look. But they people said they thought it was Kim. Someone said play brown skin girl. They said who's this white woman? They say it's the lighting, and Mama hasn't gotten any sun clearly. You know, that's what they're saying. They're saying it's the lighting of the photo, and they're saying that she hasn't been in the sun. They just said that, you know, who's this white lady? She does, she just looks very different. That's all I'm gonna say. She looks very different. But I look forward to seeing the film. I've heard good things about it, great reviews. It's not so what I've heard from people is that it's not like the Taylor Swift film where Taylor Swift just gives you the tour. I love the Eras Tour film. I thought it was so good because basically that's it. You're getting this very well shot, well cinema, uh, cinema great cinematography, well documented performance. She's basically doing her thing. You know, Taylor Swift is having a good time. She's dancing, performing all her songs from beginning to end. It's a, it's a whole tour. This apparently is woven in you know, the concert, but also, you know, Beyonce loves to give you the behind the scenes. So there's a lot of other elements that's taking place in this. But they say it's very beautiful. And I'm fortunate enough, I'm going to see an advanced screening of it. So I can't wait to tell you all about my thoughts on the film. If you haven't gotten it already, I know throughout Philadelphia, tickets are sold out across the theaters across Philly. Um, but I was going to, I'm going to be one of the first to see it. Uh, see advanced screening of it later this week. So I'm looking forward to it and I'll keep you posted on my thoughts. Um, as far as music go, it's been really chill. I mean, during Thanksgiving break time, a lot of people don't really drop music. Some people do, some people don't. Um, it's been chill. I've been going back and listening to the oldies and old classics. But something came up, an article came up in the Daily Beast that I read where fans are trying to figure out what happened to that J-Lo album that no one heard about. Remember the 20th anniversary? It was supposed to be J-Lo's greatest hits to celebrate 20 years of her career, 25 careers, 25-year anniversary of her music career. I don't know. But it was supposed to be like this real big anniversary album, and she had dropped these new songs to go with it last year. And it's been over a year, and it has not come out. And people say, like, what happened to the Missing J-Lo album? Listen, the fact that I didn't even remember that was supposed to be a J-Lo album just tells you everything you know about <laughs> J-Lo's music and her impact of the music in my life. Now, I ain't sleeping on J-Lo. J-Lo has a great career. But, like, are we really missing J-Lo music, y'all? Like, do we want more music from J-Lo? Who's buying the music? I don't know. I don't know. I just feel like J-Lo, the fact that J-Lo's been dropping albums consistently. I mean, like, listen, I feel like her last great song was, um, was it Dance on the Flow? Well, uh, la 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 if we want to get on the flow it's something like that I think it was J-Lo uh, yeah that was the last like with Pitbull uh, yeah it's called get on the floor On it's called on the floor it's called on the floor that was a jam that came out like 12 years ago and the album was called love question mark she always had an album that had love in it child she used to i remember j-lo every time j-lo that, that was j-lo's thing anything with love in it j-lo used to do but i remember this album um this song on the floor featuring pitbull still a club banger you can play at any club in philly and it's a bop like it's a perfect nightclub song pitbull was on it it came out 2011 it's been out for what 12 years now it's a hit Okay, that was a hit. That was like the last J-Lo hit for me. Everything else has been just kind of like whatever, in my opinion. Um, I mean, it's got over 2 billion views on YouTube. Okay, over 2 billion views. Billion, 2 billion views on YouTube. That music video, that energy, J-Lo was at her peak at that point as far as Music after that, I I don't, I don't know the rest of the songs she done did. That booty song that she did with Iggy Azalea, that was corny. Ain't your mama? No one cared. I mean, she hasn't done anything since that's been as good. So I don't know. I wasn't. I'm not missing the new music from her. Um, as far as TV go, y'all, I've been in the dungeon of great music. Um, that you know, uh, that's been good. Um, and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot. Um, I, I think with, with TV, I don't know. It's like when this weird period where, and you know, I think, I think it's like the writer's strike. 
which in the, in the pretty like it's like there has been no new shows because of the writer strike and everything. Now that the strike is over, people are getting ready for next year. So people are gearing up for next year. That's what I'm hearing. Um, which is fun. Abbott Elementary comes back in February, the new season, season three, which is like wow, we're already on season three. The Emmys are coming back finally. It's going to be in January. Cannot wait for the Emmys, the primetime Emmys. I'm, I mean, as far as shows go, I've been watching my Zeus, you know? Zeus has been the only consistent channel I've been watching. I mean, there's no love in hip-hop. I'm not really feeling the new Basketball Wives. I thought I was. Really not. It's okay. Housewives are just boring. I, I don't, like, I'm not really into it. I know people are into Potomac. I guess because I came late, I just don't feel like I have an interest in coming back. Like, I haven't really watched it. I hear good things about it, but I haven't really been to that. So it's just been Zeus for me, you know. Of course, I told you I watched The Crown, which I'm a little like, damn, I really did binge it. Now I just have to wait for part two in December, um, which I'm going to be watching religiously. I can't wait for The Crown part two. Um, it's grand finale, season six. But it's been really chill. It's been really chill. Now, I did hear about the writer strike that... They're working to ratify, not the writer's strike, the, the, the actors, the actor SAG, the Screen Actors Guild. The, the actors are now trying to ratify some things because apparently there's some concerns over AI and the AI situation did not get much clarity. So with AI, the conversation was dealing with AI was that they're apparently they can't they, they can't replace human actors, right? They can't they take the whole likeliness of a human actor and replace that, right? But what I'm hearing is, is that there's no clear for clarity on the fact that AI could take other body parts and create people in those ways. So AI is not replacing, you know, famous people or other actors. They're not doing that, apparently, the contract is clear on. But it doesn't specify, like, how other aspects of other humans could be replaced. So you could take somebody's lips, but you could take use someone else's eyes. And that you can create a hodgepodge of a different person and incorporate this. So there's some there's some issues with the AI conversation that is being explored. And that really stood out to me. I was like, oh, wow, they're really doing the most. So I'm, I'm curious to see how that fleshes out. But it seems like there is a big push to just get it done. So I think the unions and people are going to just say whatever and not care about the AI details. Um Apparently, people really want clarity. Like, they don't want actors. They want human actors getting awards nominations. If you're getting any type of CGI or AI type of whatever to your performance, you know, that's acting or doing that, they don't want any of that to be considered for Academy Awards or awards. They only want human performances. Wow, we're at that point in the world that now we're having these conversations. Like, it's just interesting how AI just went from zero to 100, though, in the past, like, year. Like, one moment, no one cared or was talking about that much, and now... People are worried that it's really going to start replacing acting and all kind of shit. Well, you know, listen, you better get these scientists together. You better get these innovators together. You better figure out how to put some regulations on the government. Like some of this is just like you could stop it, you know, but, you know, people, people get greedy. People do what they want to do. So it is what it is. We'll see. But, you know, reality TV is always reality TV. No one's doing any AI or reality TV. So, you know. We have that. Um, but in wrapping up, I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. Not busy. I hate the word busy. No, I'm productive. That's what I say. I'm productive. I'm productive. That's my word. Productive. Um, excited. This week is going to be full of action. I am taking my little brother to an amakasi. Um, He hasn't been to one ever. And I was surprised, but then I'm not surprised because he's like 20. But we're going somewhere fun, and I'm excited for him to try one for the first time. For those who don't know, an izakaya or amakase is, is a fine sushi tasting where it's some exquisite sushi, you know, some with caviar, some with parts. And you just try this really cool round and tasting of all this great sushi. And it's like a, full, a fun little feast. It's pricey, but it's worth it. Um, going to see Beyonce. Lip Brothers are getting together. We got we got to see Beyonce support our girl. She's having, you know, Renaissance is coming out. We're getting an advanced screen to go check it out. Um, I'm going to Detroit, like I said before, for uh, my cousin Rachel's wedding. And then I'm going to go to Delaware for the rest of the weekend. 
It's interesting. I'm doing, I'm pulling, like, I'm going to try, we're going to do multiple states, but I'm going to be in Delaware for the weekend. So any of my Delaware folks and people, I'll be out there. I'm going to some cool restaurants. I'm checking out some places that I've been wanting to go to for a minute. And so this, before I get ready to go to the South for the holidays, I got a little bucket list of a couple of restaurants that I need to go to before I head down South for the rest of the year. So I'm like doing my little wrap up of restaurants I need to go to. And next thing you know, we'll be in December. You know, we'll you know be December. You know the Sagittarius ter- terrorists are gonna be out, um, and it's gonna be quite the show. So you know, like I always say, as always, be well and be best. Earnestly speaking is recorded in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. To stay up to date with the latest on the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mr. Ernest Owens. Use the hashtag Earnestly Speaking to tell me what you thought about this episode and check out my website at ErnestOwens.com.